So I was like, April 30th wedding at four in the afternoon. We can probably make that work. You can only hunt turkeys till one in Missouri anyway. Yeah, I was like, all right, we got this. So if I'm out of the woods by one and then I get, yeah, 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 we can make this work. And I didn't hunt till one. I just hunted till about 10. Yeah, 1230. Yeah. Okay, we'll give you we'll give you some slack there. Yeah, I hunted till about 10 o'clock and then, uh, then had to get a bunch of wedding stuff That's- taken care of for the rest of the day. And we're back. Hey, Hunter Podcast, episode 17? 18, I 18? think. Yeah, 18. Damn it. <laughs> Damn it. 18. Mm-hmm. Uh, man, I feel like May is dragging. It's hot out already. I hate the heat. Really? I feel like it's flying. I hate the heat. I'm like, man. I can't believe it's almost the end of May already. I got in my truck yesterday. And obviously, it's just sitting out in the sun. But I like turned it on and said it was like 103 in my truck. I'm like, this sucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I don't like that. You know, yeah, the thing that uh, I like summer a lot, but the thing that pisses me off is I I mix protein with oat milk in my. Uh, I was I don't know. goat milk. <laughs> oat milk. Oh, oats. Oat yes. milk. Have you seen it? They're kind of taking over the 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 almond world. Milk. Yeah. Oh, they're taking over the almond milk space. Yeah, I think so. Wow. It just because it's a it's like a gluten option. That's an interesting rivalry. Or, or dairy free option, anyways. But I'm like I'm not really lactose intolerant, but I do. It messes with your belly. I notice it a little bit, and so I. It tastes great, and so I mix. Yeah, just. Um, anyways, point of the story is like I leave it in my car when I go to the gym. Oh, I don't know about that. In the winter, it's fine. Well, yeah. And in the spring, it's fine. But just oh. within the most recent milk, I'm like, <laughs> oh, milk was a bad choice. You're like, oh, my God, this oatmeal is so chunky. <laughs> I like to think it's kind of like, because you can, like, microwave milk. Like, you drink hot milk. Yeah, in oatmeal. It's just over a period of time, it starts to spoil. So my thinking is, like, I, it's hot, but oh. it's not been in there long enough to Boy, spoil. So I'm drinking, you're like. flirting with disaster, dude. At some point, you're going to get the gut rumbles and. We're all gonna know. Oh, well, I just like, gotta yeah. keep my my gym time to a like a minimum. Yeah, not more than like two hours. Why don't you just take it in with you? Put it where? I don't know. Somewhere in room temperature, not a hundred degrees. Back in the good old days, you used to be able to like you know make friends with the people that own the gym, and I mm-hmm. they'd put it in the cooler for me with all their stuff, and that was pre COVID. But not now, they don't want to touch you. Stay away. You just carry it around with you. Just a lot of stuff. <laughs> Let's I already carry my keys around with me, my mask. Put it in the locker. I don't know if I trust it in there. It's better than in 100 degrees in your car. Listen, we've we've got to have a talk about that. That's not healthy for you. Yeah. Yeah, that's not good. Anyways. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think May is flying. But we got bucks growing. Yeah, I've been chasing turkeys. I've kind of, uh, you know, we've had this battle back and forth, and it'll tie in well with today's guest. But, you know, I don't know. I've enjoyed it. It's but It's a battle. It's just, uh, I can deal with it like 30 minutes at a time. Like, mm. I went out this morning. These birds have been back there. They're gobbling their face off. They're hanging in this field behind my neighbor's house. I can't get them out of the field. I did the other day. Then they hung up. But, like, today they were hemmed up. And it's just, it's fun. And then I'm like, all right, I'm going to go have coffee and mm-hmm. eat breakfast. Mm-hmm. But the guy today is a little bit more intense around turkey hunting, for sure. And mm-hmm. deer hunting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we've got Aaron Warbritton from the Hunting Public today, as our, as our guest. Yep. Uh, recently married, right? Recently <laughs> married. Yeah, I'm sure we'll get into and that. And recent father of two kids, married yeah. into that. Yeah, stepdad now. Awesome. Uh, which will be interesting to see how he gets his guy. I know he's done some hunting with them in the past. I've seen it on some of the Hunting Public YouTube. He's taken them out. I don't know if they've actually hunted or if they've just been with him uh, out hunting. But that'll be a cool topic to get into today. And you know, Warbritton and I have known each other for. Mm, kind of as long as when we talked about Bill Winky, I mean, we all met at the same time. Um, those Which guys, is, that's how you know Aaron, right? Is yep. he was those guys not were, interning for, but probably running know, he the was, intern program. Yeah, he point. was running. You know, it was him and Greg and and <clears throat> you know Jake was there. Um, you know, all those guys were really. I didn't know Jake worked for mm-hmm. intern. Huh. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, all those guys had been there. I don't know. I don't think Ted was there, but um, Zach was obviously. You know, so all those guys were at Midwest Whitetail um, when I initially met them. And, uh, yeah, we spent a ton of time together on Bill's farm. That's who did all the filming and stuff when I was with Cabela's. And, and um, you know, when I would drive to, to Elvia, Iowa for days at a time, they ran a whole 
lot to do in LBS, so we just kind of hang out and do our thing, you know, and Eat chili dogs and put food plots in. And yeah, yeah, we had a really sweet. I'll, I'll see. We have a really sweet Mexican place in in LBI. Uh, I've heard about this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Aaron, the old enchilada supreme. Oh, dude, no. Aaron would get a burrito that was as big as a newborn baby. Uh, it was giant. And this was during his bulking phase. So we'll see how, uh, he had a, he had a pretty good bulk phase that he was working out and lifting. An intentional bulk phase? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the lifting and stuff. Really? And that dude was eating this burrito. I'm serious. It was like an eight pound newborn baby. It was yeah. a giant burrito. Um. Sounds great. Yeah. I mean, it's Mexican restaurant. What do you want? Yeah. I just had Mexican the other day. Mm. Enchilada Supreme. I don't even look at the menu. You're just When like I go to Mexican places. Number five? No. <laughs> I don't know what number it is. <laughs> I legitimately, it's become a mm -hmm. like a thing for me now. Like, what I happens if you go and they're like, "Yeah, we don't have that." You're like, "What? Hasn't happened yet. What is this place? Hasn't happened yet." <laughs> yeah, what is yeah. this place? I used to go to these Mexican places and I don't look at the menu and I always order an enchilada supreme and it hasn't failed me yet. Interesting. <laughs> so, well, um, yeah, I mean, Aaron, obviously, the hunting public is, I don't know, I'd say one of the fastest growing you know, content platforms for YouTube from a hunting perspective. Yeah. I'm sure there's others out there that are as big, if not bigger. I mean, obviously we know we talked with Jeff Sturgis and his channel's grown, but yeah, you know, these guys have been on overdrive lately. Um, well, and the, the two are like really opposites in my opinion, where Jeff's mm -hmm. is very educational and it's, um, it's rooted on a lot of, you know, either his farm or, you know, mm -hmm. farms that he's, uh, he's consulting on and Aaron's is like, theirs are all public land all over the place. It's just like a, it's just like hunting, constantly yeah. hunting. Well, I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, we'll get into with like his new relationship and family and everything is like, you know, these guys are on the road, much like we talk about us not being on the road for 90 days during the fall. They are yeah. on the road for 90 days of the Quite fall. So it's such a different thing where even like Jeff is producing a ton of content, but he's a homebody. Right. Mm -hmm. He's at home when he's producing this content. These guys are covering, you know, the country mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, starting out west and hunting for elk and mule deer and stuff and finishing off with whitetails in the south. Like it's it's nothing short of continuing to run across the country all year for a brief moment, pausing and breathing in January, February and then hitting it for turkeys, you know, March to May. So. Yeah, it's extremely time demanding, which that's what I'm kind of interested to hear some of the structure because it's it's just a small group of them. You know, it's not like they have a whole production team. It's the guys that you see on the videos are the guys who are your production people as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting to see how that all, you know, comes together and, you know, what they've seen and, and found to be successful. And, you know, obviously they're, they're doing something right because they're they're growing immensely. I mean, they're good guys. They you kind of get what you see. And I think that people like that aspect of it versus, you know, the talks that we've had about, you know, some of these entertainers in the TV space who are purely doing it from enter an entertainment standpoint. These guys are doing it because it's fun. Mm -hmm. It's what they love to do. So, want to bring more on? Let's do it. Let's bring him in. Is he sleeping? <laughs> hey. <laughs> Hi. Hey. What's what up, going on? Dudes? How are you? I'm doing good. Just chilling. Yeah? In Colombia, right? Yep. For the time being. I'll probably <laughs> head I'll probably head back up to Iowa here in the next couple of days. I've got a bunch of footage that me and Greg have got to go over. And then uh I'm going on family vacation next week, and then I'm going to Maine the week after that to go, finish man. out turkey season in June. So there you go, man. Well, we were just talking, I mean, you know, one of the things that Jared and I always hit on in this, in this podcast is that, you know, we have full-time jobs. So obviously we're not on the road in the fall for 90 days or, or in the spring for 90 days. You guys are, you know, or, or uh, uh, quite a few days, you know, during those seasons. Yeah. I mean, I haven't even been, I've only been home like probably four or five days since the beginning of March. Jeez. Like I went to, I went by the house the other day and walked in there for the first time in over a month. <laughs> and yeah, it's, 
That's so crazy. everything's in total disarray. As you can imagine, life itself pretty much ceases at yeah. the beginning of turkey season and doesn't pick back up until June. Well, you, you fit so, a wedding in there, which is impressive, man, I, yeah, especially for that time frame. It's like, okay, let's let's see when Warb would get married. There's a gap somewhere between the end of January and March 1st that seems to work out, and then maybe again in June to like mid-August. But other than that, when you slam one in turkey season, I'm impressed, man. That wasn't the original plan, <laughs> as you would imagine. Yeah. We were supposed to get married in July, but... COVID threw a wrench in that whole deal. Yeah. Oh, and last July? Already, what's that? Last July? Uh, Yeah. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, we were supposed to get married, and then COVID happened because we got engaged about a month before COVID hit. Mm-hmm. Mm. And we planned our wedding. I put the deposit down on the venue and all that stuff, and they didn't have very many openings as it was. Well, then uh, COVID hit. We had to reschedule. And they only had a few options for us to reschedule. And I think one of them was like in November. One of them was in April. But I got to thinking about it. And every year around the end of April, I'm usually hunting back where I'm from in northeast Missouri with my family. Mm -hmm. Almost every single year, I'm I'm back around here anyway. Mm -hmm. So I was like, April 30th wedding at four in the afternoon. We can probably make that work. You can only hunt turkeys till one in Missouri anyway. Yeah, I was like, all right, we got, so if I'm out of the woods by one and then I get, yeah, 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 we can make this work. And I didn't hunt till one. I just hunted till about 10. Yeah, 1230. Yeah. Okay, we'll give you, we'll give you some slack there. Yeah, I, hunt, I hunted till about 10 o'clock and then, uh, then had to get a bunch of wedding stuff. That's, taken care of for the rest of the day it's crazy man i mean it definitely the whole covid thing threw a big twist in things obviously um obviously on your side from a wedding perspective and personal perspective what do you, what about from a travel perspective because i mean obviously you guys were very uh you still did turkey tour last spring you, you obviously did deer tour this fall you know what did you guys see as you kind of traveled across the country i guess you know i'm sure there's certain places where it was like you know, locked down, crazy, you know, desolate. And then there's other places where you probably wouldn't even know COVID existed, you know, had you not watched the news and stuff. Yeah, deer season wasn't too bad, actually. But last year in turkey season is when it hit. Mm -hmm. And we were in tents in Mississippi. <laughs> yeah. Like we were, we were just starting to turkey hunt when all this stuff was going on. And I mean, I'm sure you all remember, like at the time there was all these unknowns. Sure. There was like some real fear out there. Like, what the hell's gonna happen here? Yeah. And we were just in tents in Mississippi. And I was talking to my dad on the phone. He's like, You may need to get home because they're gonna start shutting these state borders. Well, down that was here it. Yeah. I mean, everybody yeah. was fearful that like you're driving across the state. Cause I know we went down to Florida to film something. And they're like, Yeah, when you get uh down I-95 into Jacksonville, you're gonna get at a at a COVID stop. And you're like, well, what does that mean? Like, what are we, they're going to let me in. They're going to let me out. Like, you know, yeah. nobody knew. No, we planned to go to Kentucky last spring. And, uh, that was one of the places we were going to go earlier in the season, you know, mid April. And that all got shut down because of COVID. Yeah. No, the non -re That's in. what I was going to say. Cause like I had a Turkey tag for my property in Kentucky and it was invalid. No non-residents were able to hunt hmm. you know no nope. it was yeah they that happened in a lot of places and like i said when we were down in mississippi we didn't know what the heck was going to happen so mm -hmm. after the end of the mississippi trip i came home for probably like 10 days mm -hmm. but zach and jake and ted they just hopped over to alabama <laughs> and went and yeah they just they just lived in mike Pentecost's parking lot at woodhaven for like two weeks <laughs> That they sounds about accurate. Up behind a shop and just lived there for a couple of weeks. Um, and yeah, we hadn't had plans to go to Alabama, but we were like, we got to go somewhere. Yeah. We either need to go home now or we need to try to hunt somewhere fairly close to where we're at, mm. you know, where we can and, and still have enough food and water to live for another couple of weeks. Cause we literally survival at that point. That's, yeah. that's so yeah. wild, man. I mean, cause it is, it was, it was one of those things when it came out, you know, especially when they started locking things down, it's like, you know, nobody knows what this is going to be like, or I still don't think today we could really fathom like how long this thing has actually gone on. 
Um, you know, but when you guys are sitting there laid out, and I mean, obviously because of the amount of content and states you guys are covering, you've got a pretty specific strategy to where you're going, you know, each week and, and these days and these times. And that just kind of oh, yeah. goes out the window at that point. Yeah. Yeah. It threw a wrench in last spring, certainly. But by last fall, it, it didn't mess with us too much. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, we're in the absolute best place that you could be during a pandemic. Yeah. Right. Literally mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Sleeping in a tent. How about some of the parks and stuff? Anybody. <laughs> like I know when you when you guys are camping in some of these places, like during that pandemic time frame, there was a period where some of these state parks and campgrounds and stuff were shut down. I mean, did you guys there have was. some obstacles there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We certainly did. We had to uh, let me think last last spring in Tennessee, we could not camp at any of the campgrounds where we were wanting to hunt. So I actually got in touch. Well, you know, Andy Melton. Yep. Um, my buddy in Tennessee, I called him up and was like, is there anybody's yard that we could stay in <laughs> or the back of a pasture or something <laughs> like that? And he actually called the one of his relatives down there and asked him if we could boat in and stay on their ground oh, okay. on the back side of their land. So yep. that's what we ended up doing. We we just camped on the back of their land and then hunted public yeah. from there. But we've had we had to do that a couple times where we had to just camp on <laughs> private land somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then and then there's some public areas where there's dispersed camping allowed and that wasn't closed either. Sure. But a lot of times we try to stay in a campground where we have water, mm -hmm. uh, where we have electricity because we have to charge batteries and stuff all the time. Yep. But we weren't able to do that. So we were we were staying in more primitive areas and just charged and everything off a solar panel. So when you guys are doing a lot of stuff, I think a lot of people that obviously are watching hunting public videos and stuff like they see you guys doing these trips do you guys have a strategy around whether it's like, Hey, uh, whoever Zach's going to hunt here while Greg and I are back in the office or editing, or one of us is traveling to the next spot. I mean, are you guys, I guess I don't want to sound, uh, rude, but are you guys that organized or is it just more of a no. controlled chaos? Yeah. That's what I figured. No, we're not, <laughs> we're not that organized. I mean, we are to a certain extent. Mindy pretty much keeps everybody in line so that we're all getting stuff accomplished. And yeah. Greg is more organized than the rest of us. But like Mindy and Hayden are the two people behind the scenes that that you all don't see as as often. Right. But they're like, if we wouldn't have them, we'd just all be, you know, <laughs> frayed out everywhere and nothing would ever get posted. Yeah. But we we do have kind of a rough schedule that it's you know, it's fluid. It's always changing. Mm -hmm. But we're we talk amongst ourselves every week about what content is going up. Like Ted just sent me a text message 10 seconds ago asking me when this next Montana video needs to be done mm -hmm. um, that we're working on right now. So and, and that's kind of how we we plan. We basically create a rough plan for the spring or the fall. Mm -hmm. And then as things happen and as things change, as they do. Um, we just make adjustments, but every week towards the end of the week, we, we kind of communicate with one another to see what type of content we have to put out that week. And are you, are you guys all editing or are there certain yeah. ones? Everybody's editing. Everybody's editing. Everybody's filming, um, for the most part. And, uh, there are some, there's some trips where we all are going and several of us are getting tags and mm -hmm. there's some trips where, just a couple of us are going. Mm -hmm. But like you said, you know, me and Greg may be somewhere and Zach may be across the country somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And Ted and Jake may be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know. And then and then the next week we're all together in one spot. Yeah. Well, so, like, like even, the main trip that we're going on, it'll we'll all be there. You'll all be there. Deal. And that's probably a lot because most of the seasons are winding down. So there's not a ton of yep. opportunities anymore anywhere that's else. Right. Yeah, usually that's how it is. At the beginning of the season, we're all together, and at the end of the season, we're all together, mm -hmm. and then in between, just we scattered. just kind of float. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know, like, even when you guys get to, like, in the fall side, you know, one of the things I think that's built a lot of momentum is is the public land challenge, obviously, and, and bringing guys yeah. like, you know, Dan and Jeff together on those sides as well. You know, it seems like those kind of become the big meetups where you guys try to bring everybody in to, you know, at least at some point, everybody or most of you guys are are there or present yeah most of us go to the challenge every year yeah um 
but in the past we only one of us from thp has got a license because the the challenge is is a challenge <laughs> to produce <laughs> yeah um just because there's so much footage coming in in a given day i mean you have three to five groups of hunters out there every day mm -hmm. cataloging you know creating content and then they're coming in and they're dumping everything on our hard drives we usually bring our camper along for the public land challenge and at least two of us are sitting in there non-stop editing That's trying crazy, to get man. what, what, to get what is the up. format for the challenge like how do you guys what is the challenge uh basically we just pick a new piece of public land that the participants are not familiar with uh it could be anywhere i mean last year we went to pa and who are the participants is it just open to anybody no we usually just pick like a small group to collaborate with uh, in the past we've had up to like five or six teams but last year we we trimmed that back to i believe there was three mm -hmm. you know between us the hunting beast and then uh jeff sturgis mm -hmm. and we had we had some other people also with us some other buddies in camp that were hunting as well that were contributing but for the most part there'll be three or four kind of core groups that we follow on a day-to-day -day basis so the video will come out and we'll basically bounce from group one to group two to group three to group four you know in in each video just to sort of track their progress as they're going and basically try to learn how they're breaking things down day by day on mm -hmm. these new areas it's crazy and, i mean i know like last so last year was uh pennsylvania then, yep. was it minnesota before that michigan michigan before that yeah you got minnesota me. minnesota before that so we went minnesota michigan pa right. is it a bow and this hunt year, there's a, a good chance we'll do it in indiana indiana yeah very cool man we'll give you some of weston spots he's got some got some, some pens for you some pens for you yeah <laughs> that's cool but i know because like watching pennsylvania is obviously and us being from here and and kind of cutting our teeth on some of that stuff you know, it, it's, uh, it's cool to see how every one of those groups I felt like had a very different strategy. You know, if you yeah. look at like, you know, how Dan and the hunting beast group were going into these big ridges and constantly, you know, trying to work up and find sign and then set up on the sign, you know, Jeff's in clear cuts, trying to get in between bedding and ag, um, you know, Zach and those guys are literally just working clear cuts and know that deer are in there. They just got to figure out how to get in front of them. You know, and it's yeah. just as you see this kind of structure laid out, you know, it really kind of paints the picture of how it is so diverse of everybody hunting that ground. Nobody was had really the same strategy, you know, when they went into it. And so when you see that kind of thing, it I think it makes it a cool aspect for people watching it to say, well, yeah, like I'm, I'd be doing what in my case, I would have been doing what Dan was doing, which is working these benches and the sign and finding acorns and things like that. What is the objective? Kill buck. <laughs> just a legal buck. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. I mean that the objective is basically just to teach people as much as possible through these different strategies. Well, well I don't you mean, know, I don't mean from a lot of people point of... think of the challenge as like, it's a competitive type of a thing sure. to where whoever kills the biggest buck wins the challenge. But we've never really looked at it that way. It's always just like, we, it's cool to challenge ourselves to go and hunt a difficult area that we've never been before. Yeah. So that's where the, that's kind of where the public land challenge aspect came from. And then when you invite these different groups there with these different perspectives and different strategies, then you end up coming out with all of this basically educational content. Cause as you know, there's multiple ways to skin the cat out there. For sure as you can see from the challenge videos. Yeah. Uh, because like you alluded to, everybody's using a slightly different strategy. Yeah. So. Well, I, under, I understand your intention in um, doing the challenge. That That's awesome. But I mean, when you guys all get together, <clears throat> it's not like you just say, hey, let's go, let's go into the woods and just film some stuff. Like wh what is the, what is the goal? Is it just to kill a legal buck? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what, yep. Yep. And in our case, or where those guys were, they had antler restrictions, right? So NPA. three points, three points to a side, I think where you guys were at up North, right? Aaron? Yeah, there was, there was restrictions in some places that mm -hmm. we went. I mean, some, in some instances we were driving, you know, a couple hours from camp mm -hmm. and hunt mm -hmm. some, sometimes we were hunting within five minutes of camp. Right. So, 
Yeah. It all depends because we were going outside of that county every once in a while. Yeah. Is there a winner of the public land challenge? <laughs> no. No. I think there's really. just probably I mean, a, some people, a survivor. People can come up with a winner if they want to. But if you look at it, like last year, Zach killed the biggest buck. Mm -hmm. But Dan and Joe probably got on more deer. For sure. And Dan almost got an opportunity at a really nice mature buck. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I don't, I don't really know. I, in my mind, I would say they're both winners because Zinger's uh, strategy eventually worked out almost to perfection yep. and he harvested a, a nice buck for PA, mm -hmm. you know, but then Dan and Joe were going in there and they got on bucks and, and on the last day, Dan almost shot a mature buck, like the biggest buck that we saw the whole trip. Right. So it kind of depends on it kind of depends on what your individual goals are as you, if you were to pick a winner, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you're going to that area and you're, you've set your sights on a mature buck only, then Dan was the guy that got close, closest in order to do that, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. if you're going to that area and you just, you want to harvest a nice buck, um, then Zinger would be the winner, yeah. I guess. <laughs> I, yeah. I think yeah. I think it's a good, that's a good transition. That's just hunting, yeah. Yeah, well, and we kind of, we've talked about this with everybody, obviously. So, Winky's been on here. Uh, Jeff's been on here. And one of the things that we consistently are talking about is, like, the management of expectations as a hunter. You know, with where you're at, what what kind of property you're hunting. You know, is it pressure, like Pennsylvania, is it not? You know, and I think that you guys are a really good example of that because, you know, you could go to a state like Pennsylvania and, you know, you're looking just for a good buck, a legal buck, obviously, but a good buck. But obviously when you guys are back home in Iowa, especially like you're not going to shoot the first two year old 10 point that you see, you know, in most cases, you know, at least for you in particular, like I know you usually are setting your sights on a better buck one, maybe because you guys have more time to hunt some of that stuff, but two, you know, the area, you know, what bucks are in that area. So, you know, a lot of conversations that we have is we'll hear like, Oh, you know, like the hunting public guys are just out shooting bucks. Like they really don't care. And in some cases it's like, Hey, we're just trying to have a good experience and fun. But there are some cases where you guys are trying to kill better deer. I mean, who doesn't want to shoot a bigger buck, you know? Sure. Yeah. And I would say I used to be like when I was working for Bill at Midwest Whitetail, I was way more picky then than I am now, even in Iowa, mm -hmm. because then we were in Iowa most of the time. We weren't traveling near as often, Sure, but sure. now uh, we do have more time in Iowa as we, because it's our home mm -hmm. than we do these other places, but less time than I used to have. Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, you know, back in 14 and 15 and 16, we were there yeah, all, all year the time. long. Yeah. Like we, we were out there scouting nonstop. Yep. So we, and we had been keeping tabs on bucks. I mean, we were even hunting some individual deer at some points. Mm -hmm. but then once thp started and i started traveling around more and more like this past year we had about two and a half weeks to hunt iowa in october mm -hmm. and uh that was you know beyond that we're traveling elsewhere so yeah. i would say my standards have probably went down a little bit because of that yeah. um but to your point yes we we definitely when we're in iowa i mean it's a target rich environment in a lot of spots mm -hmm. so and I mean, you guys are still encountering, you know, the one pe thing people think is like, oh, it's Iowa. Like there's not, you guys are still encountering a lot of hunters where you guys go. I mean, there, oh, yeah. there are people putting pressure on those deer, you know, regardless, but you guys are also still, you know, running into some good bucks, you know, and deep. Yeah, I think, mostly. I think something that's real important to note about Iowa public land, because I get asked this question a lot. So I'll just, I'll just break it down for you real quick. Um, People always ask about the pressure on Iowa public land because there a lot of folks are putting in for points and they want to come out and they want to hunt, you know. Mm -hmm. In October and in late November, the hunting pressure is almost non-existent out there. Like there's very few people that are that are hunting, in which we see that in, in most places that we go, hunting pressure is light, sure, you know, during those times. But in Iowa, we don't see anybody. Mm -hmm. Once first week in November rolls around, totally different story. It is a high volume of bow hunters traveling in to hunt public land. And I would argue that it is just as high as some of the other major whitetail states that we hunt. Interesting. Um, in early November. And then during the gun season in December on public land, like the first and second shotgun seasons, 
it is up there with some of the highest hunting pressure that I've seen anywhere. Straight war zone. Yeah. Oh, it's a war. Well, I mean, if you've seen some of these videos, I've had I've had slugs and bullets and stuff slinging by me. I mean, we're <laughs> filming 40, 50 hunters in one day on one area. That's crazy. Because that's man. what they do in Iowa. They they get in these big groups and they drive, they push mm-hmm. because these the shotgun seasons are so limited. Yep. So the deer get the deer get ridiculous amounts of pressure for a very very short period of time and then it slacks off again and then come late muzzleloader there's almost nobody out there so there's definitely these big peaks and valleys when it comes to hunting pressure there Mm -hmm. Um, do you ever get frustrated hunting public land in that sense sure i mean just depend just depends on the the situation i suppose but like after uh, about the sixth hunter you're like man why did we call this the hunting pub (laughs) (laughs) anymore i i don't get as frustrated as i used to because we're out there dealing with this type of thing all the time yeah. so it's kind of like yeah you know they're probably going to move deer somewhere else maybe they're going to move deer to a different spot on this and area you've got that, time i mean this is all you guys do pretty much is bounce around from public land to public land so it's not like you can't go find another yep. tract we do, but even in that sense, I mean, the day that I got shot at in gun season a couple of years ago, I, I, I saw so many hunters. I probably saw 40 hunters that morning or more in a matter of a couple hours. Wow. But that afternoon, I went into a spot on the backside of that area where I hadn't seen anybody go, and I saw like over 20 bucks that night. Mm. So that when you get high volumes of hunting pressure like that, it discourages a lot of people, but mm-hmm. what it's in effect it's doing is it's probably creating a absolute hot spot on that area somewhere, mm-hmm. because if there's one little patch of thick brush on there that they're not pushing, it just literally pushes all those deer into a ball. Yeah. And you, you wind up in those situations where, and we've seen this in multiple States, um, some of our very best hunts that we've ever had where we're seeing like 30, 40 deer in a sit and 20 plus bucks have been in situations like that where the hunting pressure was extremely high Mm -hmm. because they all get pushed into a a small area. And it's just figuring out where that area is on that given day because it could change day to day Yeah, based on the pressure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good point because I mean, if you start to look at, you know, whether it's the public land challenges or just as you guys are going through deer season and stuff, you know, it's inevitable that you're going to run into people as will deer. But I mean, there's a reason you're still seeing big deer. Like they know where to go to escape it. And in some cases it's private land, but in a lot of cases it's just nooks and crannies and public land that just don't get hit, you know? And if you can find your way to set up in those places. And I think the big thing is to be, you know, something to be patient because you killed the buck that you killed in Iowa this past year with your bow on the ground. That was later in the morning, right? Yeah, it was around close to 9 a.m., mid-October. Yep. And I, I think that's the thing, you know, because everybody, and, and we do too as whitetail hunters, right, we're instantly gravitating towards Halloween and on, right? We're like, oh, once we get to that point, like, things just get, but it also comes with pressure, you know? And so those deer behavior are not only changing because of the rut, it's changing because there's increased hunting pressure happening as well. And you know, acorns in some cases are starting to fade off from, from their peak. And, you know, all those different factors come into play that I think a lot of people don't think about, you know, when they're getting out there and they're, they're starting to approach different areas or, or where they've been, you know, I know when we worked, when you guys were at Midwest Whitetail and, and you spent more time in Iowa, you guys were running trail cameras and stuff. Are you guys still running those as much, um, as you used to, I mean, just with bouncing through, you know, multiple States and stuff like that? Yeah, I'd say we are. Um, they're way more scattered yeah. and purposeful now than they used to be. Yeah. Um, we we run a lot of them long term where we set them up for months and months and don't touch them for a long time. We'll, some of them that we run, we'll even set up in July and we won't grab them until February or January. Wow. And then just go back through the entire fall. Are you guys not running camera. cell cameras? We are some. Some. We have we have some cell cameras mm-hmm. that we run, and then some just you know your traditional trail cameras. But we still use them, you know, as a tool. Ted harvested his buck in Iowa this year, based off of a lot of data that mm-hmm. we got off trail cameras on mm-hmm. opening day. Mm-hmm. You know, 
know, and we use them as, especially a bunch in the in October. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, to to kind of narrow down areas and whatnot. But but it seems like we're if we're putting them in and if we're putting them in intrusive areas like bedding areas and stuff, we don't touch them. We just leave them in there and let them do their thing. If we're if we're wanting to check them every couple of weeks, we'll put them along the edge of a place where we're wanting to hunt. I mean, several hundred yards usually away from where we're wanting to hunt. Right. Mm -hmm. When you guys are, I, I guess the, you know, obviously having turkey tour and deer tour, and I think we talked about this with Tennessee, you know, when you guys went and hunted um, for the turkey tour in Tennessee, I guess not this past year, year before, but um, you guys use that a lot as scouting opportunities for fall for potentially coming back in deer season, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. We're always thinking about deer and in deer season, we're always thinking about turkey. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, anytime I see a big group of gobblers in November or October, I'm dropping pins, boy. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of thing that, you know, we talked, we were talking about a couple of weeks ago on this is that as we start to get into like turkey season and stuff, you know, especially I, I like the earlier parts of turkey season, woods are still open. You know, I'm, I'm seeing, you know, old scrapes, trails are a lot more visible, bedding areas look a lot different. You know, it's a great time to be able to get out there without having to worry about what you're doing to the deer or a particular buck in that area to just get boots on the ground and move around as you're also turkey hunting at the same time. Oh, yeah, definitely. We do that. We do that often. When you guys start to look, and I guess, uh, so this would be kind of coming in on uh, like the Georgia hunt this past year, which I think we can, we can all kind of agree that that buck was kind of a surprise buck in Georgia in muzzleloader season. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but like when you didn't expect to see anything like that when you're there. in that area, I mean, it, it, that's just kind of the weird thing. Cause obviously you guys are covering so much ground, so much different public land. You get into an area like that and like, you know, you're, you're putting forth a, some sort of a plan and strategy and effort. But when, when, you know, a doe comes through like that and just brings all those bucks with her, like, what is the thought process at that point? Because I mean, it, it just completely explodes any kind of expectations that you guys have at you know, of like, Hey, let's go out and kill a legal buck. Well, that was, that was our last day. Actually, I was only going to hunt until about noon or so. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we had a lot of confidence in that spot because I just killed a buck out of there a few days before that. Mm -hmm. And we'd at that point, we'd stage hunted into that area on one side of it early in the hunt. Mm -hmm. And then we stage hunted in there the morning that I harvested that first buck. So we knew the type of sign that was, was in the general vicinity. We just hadn't hunted the center of it. Mm -hmm. So there was some super remote stuff right in the middle that we hadn't gone to. And that was where we were headed that morning and we didn't even make it there. I mean, they come storming out of the brush, you know, 35 minutes after daylight as we were still hunting through the, through that timber. <laughs> um, but yeah, thought process immediately changes to that particular situation you know we were still hunting trying to just catch slight movement in the distance on the far ridges ahead of us to see if we could pick up a deer moving through there doing anything mm -hmm. and to your point just trying to harvest another legal buck right but then when she comes by there dragging you know three four bucks with her um everything goes out the window at that point you're yeah you're thinking like rut you're thinking this is a full-on rut situation where the mature buck is totally focused on the doe mm -hmm. so if we can keep from spooking her too bad these other bucks they don't care about them at all sure so it yeah the strategy definitely changed and went to, you know went to from just being mildly aggressive to super aggressive once we saw that he was with her and she was obviously in heat and I mean, you honed in on him at that point, right? It was like, hey, we we wanna we wanna put a pin on that guy and continue to to get close to him and and make an approach on him. Oh yeah, definitely. But I mean, there was another nice a pointer in the group that I probably would have shot if you would have gave me the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I I only had like two or three hours left right. to hunt. And um, it, it seemed like those guys at the check station too were they were obviously, I mean they they're there all the time, right? They're spending time. They were surprised too. In terms of oh, yeah. coming in and seeing that, that's kind of yeah. Weird. I mean the the record at the check station is a mid one thirties deer. Yeah, um, like <laughs> that's the that's the, since they've been scoring them and keeping track of that stuff on that particular WMA. That's the biggest one that they've killed out of there Jeez. out of all the deer seasons. You know, so when I saw this thing, I'm like, 
that's really, really big. Like that's a, that's a buck that I would shoot in Iowa for sure. And this thing's in Georgia in the mountains. Like, yeah. this is nuts. That thing's huge. And those deer are small bodied. Sure. Like the buck was the first buck I killed was, you know, like in an 80 pound pack basically. <laughs> And this thing we figured weighed maybe 130 pounds. Really? 140 pounds. Wow. And that was what, mid December? Yep. So yeah. I mean, you're you're talking these deer are a third of the size of some of the mature bucks in Iowa. Right. In some cases. So when this thing comes bolting out of the brush sporting that rack, I mean, he looks, looks absolutely like enormous yeah. because they're just so much smaller bodied. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, that the cool aspect there is that, you know, one of the things that, that we've worked on here in the last, you know, year or two is this relationship with some of these state departments from a, from a content angle and, and from an, a kind of a highlighting the opportunities that exist. And I think there's a great case in point in that you're in a WMA in the mountains of Georgia of which, you know, we talk about Iowa and Kansas and Illinois and everybody's like, yeah, that's, you know, this is where I want to go. And it's not saying that it's easy in the mountains of Georgia, but the opportunities exist, which is the whole point of this kind of relationship that we're doing with the states is to showcase the opportunities that exist in these states that, you know, maybe go unnoticed in some cases. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many uh, going into that hunt. I by the end of it, I was just blown away at how much fun we had in Georgia. Yeah. You know, and how and it was definitely a challenge, but it was so cool to hunt deer in a different environment like that than what we were what we were accustomed to. Yeah. I mean, you're you're just hunting them in totally different habitats. I'd love to go and hunt them in Florida at some point, you know, down in those swamps and that sort of thing because it's completely different so the entire time your mind is occupied with learning new stuff mm -hmm. so from that standpoint it was it was awesome and like you alluded to there's a tremendous amount of opportunity there in a bunch of different bunch of different areas that we go to i mean we haven't even scratched the surface of some of these places well, where I that hardly ever get talked about from you know, a deer hunting standpoint. Well, and I think that's kind of it is you start to look at the number one is like, what's the goal or what's the expectation when I get there? Like if I go to Iowa or Kansas, like I'm trying to kill a big buck, right? But sure. I, I still would like to kill a mature buck if I go to the mountains of Georgia or to Tennessee. But at the same time, like I have to be real with myself of, you know, I'm probably not going to come out of there with a five-year-old that's 150 inches you know, and, and that's okay. And I think that that's how people have to start to look at this stuff is, you know, we kind of hunt and we especially bow hunt or gun hunt, you know, for an experience, uh, when we go into these different lands or these different public grounds. And so if you kind of look at what you're going to go in there and try to hunt, like, yeah, maybe you have an expectation to go in and kill a mature deer, but it's not going to be like if you're hunting in Iowa or you're hunting in Kansas and stuff. And so I think that kind of, as you guys showcase some of the opportunities there, you know, I would say there's very few places, especially, in, you know, during the deer tour that you guys go that you don't at least have a run in with what I would consider to be a big buck for that area. Yeah, most places we go, I mean, including Michigan. Yeah. Like we've heard just absolute horror stories from folks out of Michigan for years. Yeah. And when we went up there for the public land challenge, um, it certainly is a challenge uh the, there's so many hunters in michigan it's there's a lot of pressure on those deer mm -hmm. but there's also a ton of public land yeah so when we got up there we found ourselves with all of these different opportunities and it was like okay well if plan a b c and d didn't work out we had 10 more beyond sure. that that we could go and check mm -hmm. and by the end of that trip i think we'd saw close to a handful of mature bucks mm-hmm well, and that's you know, it. I mean, it, it's when you're bow hunting, if that's kind of the goal, right? Is just it. to get is just to see a mature buck. If that's what you're after, I should say. Yeah. It's like if you see a mature buck and then you get close to having an opportunity with a mature buck, that's meeting your goals as a bow hunter. I mean, as you guys know, bow hunting requires a lot of luck in sure. order to get them to yeah. 15 yards broadside. Exactly. You can you can put yourself in the position to hunt those deer and mm -hmm. see those deer, but then to get them you know, close enough to shoot. That's where the time invested comes in. Probably more luck than we all like to admit. 
Oh yeah, it's a lot. Of, it's an insane amount of luck to oh, get to, to get a big buck that to get a big buck that close. But just being able to find them mm. and see them is the is the challenge. In most mm. places we go, like you said, Jeremy, we're we see at least one yeah mature buck what in would, those areas. I mean, we say? saw a whole pile of them in Tennessee when we went. What would you say, Aaron, is like your uh, your primary objective when it comes to maybe? When it comes to hunting is maybe too broad of a question but it's like are you trying to accomplish different things in different states or with different yeah. groups of people that you're hunting with and maybe Definitely. talk about that a little bit yeah it depends on where we're going if we're uh like in tennessee for example when we went there we went with a big group we were collaborating with the seek one boys yep and we were there for like five or six days and we're archery hunting so it's like yes maybe we'll see a big mature buck and we'll get an opportunity but what i'm what i'm looking for on a trip like that is a good ethical opportunity at a nice buck like i would th there's a chance that i'd see a mature buck at 100 yards but then you know you're still you're stuck at that point with a bow well so but like why I did you guys a nice buck at 15 yards broadside that meets my expectations like that's what i'm wanting to to do is set up and get an ethical shot at a nice buck. Mm -hmm. Why did you guys select Tennessee? Like, was the objective of that of that trip just to hunt with the Seek One guys, or did you go to Tennessee because there was an opportunity you were looking to capitalize on? Uh, we went to Tennessee because there's a lot of deer in Tennessee, and there's like a lot of the public opportunities down there. You have tons of action. Mm -hmm. I mean, even with turkeys, that's one thing I've I've noticed about my uh, time in Tennessee is every time I go down there, it's just constant action. Mm -hmm. And that's what I heard about hunting deer in Tennessee was like, Oh man, you'll see a lot of deer and there's a lot of bucks here. Yeah. There just may not be as many big mature bucks as there is in other places. And when you think about it, that buck that I killed in Iowa last fall, mm -hmm. that was the only deer that I saw in there in three days of hunting yeah. basically. Yeah. And that was the only deer I saw that morning that I killed him. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know super stoked to shoot that deer but we were going to tennessee and we were seeing you know five to ten deer every sit on average mm -hmm. and every spot that we bounced around to we were seeing piles of deer so it's just constantly yeah you know active and you got a pretty Which liberal uh, fun i mean it's you, really fun you got a pretty liberal bag limit in tennessee yeah, too. You killed two bucks one yeah. per day with a bow. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the other thing you start to look at is like when you're, when you're out there hunting in these places, like, you know, Iowa, for example, like if you're not a landowner, you know, you got, here's your tag, you know, fill your tag type of thing. And, and yep. obviously, you know, when you're in Tennessee and you've got more of a liberal bag limit or Mississippi or Alabama, like, you know, you can go out there and kill multiple bucks you know, the, it just kind of opens up the opportunity, which probably changed your expectations in that, like, if I'm out hunting Tennessee for a week and I can kill two bucks, like, I'll probably, you know, first opportunity at a good ethical shot at a nice buck, I'm going to take, and then maybe I'm a little pickier on my next one until the days close out and I want to fill my tag. Right. And that's, and then to answer your question, Jared, that's pretty much what we were doing is like, let's go down here and see how many deer we can kill in a few days with our bows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we'll have meat for our freezer. And then we were, we were also donating deer mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. to that state program so which was really cool so that's basically what we we're doing and, and like jeremy said you have a liberal bag limit you can shoot all these does you can shoot all these bucks mm -hmm. um down there so we were just we were harvesting a bunch of deer and getting a lot of good practice you know in close range situations with the bow um it was a it was a blast. It seems so interesting so. as you go south, like it, cause like, obviously I lived in Mississippi for a long time. You know, I lived in Columbia where, where Aaron's at. And you know, the, the cool thing about, you know, Missouri is that, you know, you could kill a buck with your bow, right. And then you kill another buck, but it can't be until what, after gun season, right. Or after the rifle season with the yep. bow tag. So like you could kill multiple right. bucks in, in Missouri, which was cool. But for, you know, my entire life living in Pennsylvania, or even when we go to Kansas, you got one buck, mm -hmm. right? And that's it. You kill your buck seasons over as you start to migrate South into Tennessee and Mississippi and Alabama, all of a sudden it's like, man, I could kill three bucks in Alabama and four does on a single tag. And it's like, but I'm still seeing numbers of deer that oftentimes are more than I would see in Pennsylvania or, or even Missouri or Kansas. 
And it's so funny because you think about how like the culture of the South is so rich in hunting, yet the bag limits are very liberal. The amount of deer that you see in most cases is a lot more than mm -hmm. these other places. I don't know. It's it's something to be said because a lot of people will always be like, ah, I wish they would just cut it to a one buck bag limit. Like that'll make things better. I don't know. I see a ton of deer in the South. I see a lot of big bucks in the South as well. And they're pretty much wide open for what you can harvest. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Our expectations change everywhere we go. Yeah. I mean, just kind of depends on the time we have available to hunt that area and uh, the type of bucks that are in that area. I mean, like you said earlier with Iowa, we're definitely pickier there, but that's because we have more time mm -hmm. gone in Iowa yeah. than we do in other places. And you guys started doing some Western hunting, uh, as well. Uh, is that on yep. the docket for this year too? Uh, you mean Western whitetails or like mule deer elk type uh, Mule deer elk or... a little bit. I know you guys have done some Western whitetail in the Dakotas and stuff. Well, we consider that Western at least, but I guess on a mule deer yep. elk standpoint, um, we're still, the jury's still out on whether or not we're going elk hunting this year. Um, I think the boys are waiting to see if they're going to draw Wyoming permits. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have an elk tag this year. I went last year and me and Ted are going to be working on a bunch of elk videos for the channel that'll mm -hmm. come out in August. You guys spent a lot of time out there, huh? Yeah. I was out in Wyoming. Ted and I were for 14 days. Yeah. So when I, when we get an elk permit, it pretty much just ev everything else stops <laughs> during that time. Yeah. Um, but it's not something that we're, that we do nonstop. I mean, on average, at least one of us goes elk hunting every year, mm -hmm. but I mean, we're not like the born and raised guys where we go elk hunting every year, sure. you know, for 40 days straight or whatever. Well, one of the things that we started doing is, um, going to the Dakotas for mule deer. And so last year was our first year in North Dakota. We drew on public. We drew again on public for North Dakota this year. Um, and then we also uh, took a lease in South Dakota to try to do a double on the way out there, mainly because you can't hunt public land in South Dakota for mule deer until October 1st as a non-resident, which seems crazy. Right. But, um, so we kind of had to force our hands into the private there, but you know, our, I've, been, I've been having some success with, uh, just calling up yeah. landowners too. <clears throat> Most of them yeah. seem pretty open to, you know, being willing to have us out there. Their concern right now is the lack of rain. Yeah. Fire warnings and fire hazard. But, you know, fortunately it looks like we got some in the forecast here. So I've, I've delayed making any more calls until they get Cut an inch of rain, a little precipitation. And then I'll, I'll start making phone sure. calls again. Yeah, that sounds really fun. Yeah, the the North Dakota one was pretty interesting because we, you know, we're pretty novice at it. I mean, we're whitetail guys, right? And and you know, specifically call it Midwest white turn uh, whitetail guys. But you know, when we we just kind of put in as like, hey, you know, here there's a lot of mule deer in North Dakota, and like public land's pretty available. You know, out towards the Badlands, like let's just put in. So we did, and uh, got drawn last year, and man, it was. It's crazy how many bucks that we saw on public land out there. Like, it's insane. There's a ton yeah. of deer. No pressure either. Nobody out there hunting. There's is... nobody out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and we went even further. So we were getting some leads from a guy that works for the Mule Deer Foundation. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, everybody goes, you know, pretty much to wherever that was north of us. I guess mm -hmm. he's like, but if you guys are willing to drive another hour and a half, it's like, we already drove 23 hours. We might as well. Yeah, we will. And, yeah. and we got out there further and we had a absolute blast. Yeah, there was nobody out there. I mean, we had a couple residents that were mule deer sparse. hunting and then some guys that were pronghorn hunting. And other than Where that, we're going in South Dakota, uh, dare I say, looks even more desolate. Yeah. Yeah, there's like yeah. nobody in that county. So. No, nah, there's not. Out there in Wyoming and Montana and the Dakotas, there's gobs of land that you can hunt and there's mm -hmm. very few people around. So it's a cool experience, if you're willing to man. make the sacrifice to drive all that way, you know, and buy the non-resident tags, it can be awesome hunting. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's what we're looking at areas. is that like, you know, obviously, and I think yours does too, you know, we get real hot and heavy come October one. Right. But in September, you know, unless yep. you go out West or you hunt, you know, a place like Kentucky, you know, there's not a lot going on. Yeah, I've on. done that. I don't, I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> oh man. If you're going to go, I'm, it's a good place to shoot a velvet buck, no doubt, but 
when we were down there, it was 94, 95 mm -hmm. during the day. Lows at night were in the low 80s. Yeah. Wow. And it's when we hot. shot, but we did kill bucks. But when we did, I mean, they were just tick infested. Just, yeah. I mean, we had to get them out of the woods as quickly as possible. And mm -hmm. it was just kind of a rodeo, to be honest. I hate but, that, man. I hate, I, mean, I can't hunt. I'm all for opportunity. So, if, yeah. You know, if you're wanting to shoot a velvet buck and that's closer to home for you, that's a good that's a good option. Just be prepared to sweat your butt off. <laughs> it's a good state. I mean, it you know, we've got we've got a bunch of ground in Kentucky that we can hunt. And I mean, I don't I just haven't seen bucks early in the season. Like all of my deer really start to move in in mid October, or late October. So I'm I'm assuming they're hung up on ag somewhere, you know, and yeah. I just But none of it's ag ground. I, yeah, it's probably yeah, why. We don't have any ag ground at all right now. It's all mountains. So. Shady side of bean fields in the evenings. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, and that's what you guys ended up doing, right? Is you ended up finding those publics that you had, you know, ag adjacent to, you know, and just knew that's where those bucks were kind of rolling out to, you know, on the evenings. Yeah. But. Ted killed his in between a bedding area and a private soybean field mm -hmm. um, on public. And then I shot mine actually on the border of public and private because we we had went all the way up to the edge of the bedding on the public right up to the property boundary and we'd been watching all those bucks in that bean field mm -hmm. so after two or three hunts of watching them you know out in that in those beans i kind of figured well there's a chance they're going to come across on the public to get a drink in this water hole or i can just call and get, try to get permission to shoot across their fence mm -hmm. so i called them and was like hey can i shoot you know 40 yards into your beans from the public side and they were like yeah that's cool. Go ahead. So that's crazy. Cause most people would instantly be like, ah, uh, you know, there's a line. Like I'm, I'm screwed. I can't do anything. Yeah. You they know? hunted, but I, I told them, I asked them where they were hunting on the property. And I told them like, I didn't want to get in their hair yeah. at all or anything, but if they would just allow me to shoot onto the, into the edge of their beans, I could probably kill a buck in the next couple of days or get a chance at a buck, you know? Yeah. And the, the guy was nice enough to let me do that. See, Aaron must have good sales skills. We talked about this mm -hmm. last week that good track record. people people will go and they'll be like, yeah, you know, I called 20 places and everybody turned me down. I'm like, you suck at sales. <laughs> like you, you just aren't good. <laughs> like I'm, you're going to get turned down on some points, but like if you're getting down, turned down 20 times in a row, you better change your tone. <laughs> I don't know, man. Some people, I hear that from people all the time about getting permission and I kind of relate to them in some senses because I get super nervous, like walking up to somebody's house and asking them for permission. Yeah. Like I, I That's will funny. certainly do it if I need to. Yeah. Um, but like Jake and our group, he'll, he'll just be like, yeah, whatever. I'll just, I'll just walk out, you know, and, Try that's, to run up to this guy well, on his tractor. That's how Jared will be. No, let me go. Yeah, you will. Dude. I will if, do dude, it. I get, a, I get nervous. If there's a guy though. on a tractor yeah. and you're like, yeah, that's the guy to ask, you're out. You'd be going. I I'm, do. I get nervous, though. Yeah. Same deal. Like, I'm like, <laughs> and then I press, press it. You just got to force yourself to press, you know, call or whatever. And I just don't want to, like, interrupt them. That's like when I yeah, go to a house. Yeah, that's my thing, too. Like, it's just, like, uh, man, this guy's out here working. I'll yeah. tell you a quick story. We were just in Georgia with Giannis Patelis for Meat Eater. And... We were going, to, we were trying to get access to this piece of public that was landlocked and we've been hearing birds on it all the time. So mm -hmm. we we're, we we're trying to get access and there's like four or five yards basically with houses in the end of this subdivision that you could, if they would let you walk through their yard, you could get access to 800 acres of public that was landlocked. Well, we asked the first couple people and they were nice, but they wouldn't let us go. Um, just, they didn't feel comfortable with us going through the yard, which is fine. Mm -hmm. um then we got to the guy at the end of the cul-de-sac and i started walking down his driveway and he's busy he's out there working with like some wood and stuff by a shop and he just looks up there at us and just screams what do you want uh oh and, we're, and me and yanni are like hey we just wanted to see if we could access through your ground to go back there turkey hunting and he just said hell no i don't allow anybody back there there's enough people around here as there is, as it is we're like okay real sorry you know and we turn around and starting to leave <laughs> I was like, this guy is really pissed that we're here. Well, I got in the truck and then all of a sudden I had my window down and he's like, how long are you wanting to go? Huh? <laughs> and I was like, just for today, just for today. And he's like, oh, come back down here and talk to me. So we Holy went back cow, down and we, we, wound it up. we wound up talking to him. I told him I was from Iowa and we were in Georgia Turkey again for a short period of time. 
and he was a super cool dude. He just had had some bad experiences with people I in bet, the past. Man. You know? Well, that's but really what it comes I got down to talking to him. He realized like that we were pretty chill and that we weren't going to screw up anything on his property. Yeah, he was that, that's totally been, fine with us going back there. That's been my experience. Is usually if it, if I get a no, it's it's like a, hey, you know, you, you seem you know, nice enough and I'd love to let you, but I've just had some bad encounters with it's everybody, yeah, man. people I, they've let hunt in the past yeah. or people trespassing and not asking. And mm -hmm. yeah, that was the case with this dude. Um, but he eventually, he eventually let us go back there and he was telling us about where he's seeing turkeys at and all that by the end of it. But yeah. when yeah. he saw us in camo walking down his driveway, his initial reaction was not good. Well, and that's the tough spot for, for all of us as hunters is there are some real bad seeds out there that have set a precedence that isn't good. Right. And is literally a, a big hump for us to get over. And it's not because of how most of us act. It's just because how a few of us act. Right. And the moment oh, yeah. those people have those experiences, like in Kansas where we lease, we hunt mostly public around where we're at, but the cattle farms are nice to have access to right around there, especially if you kill a buck. Like those guys have had cattle shot during season and they're like, yeah, I won't let anybody hunt here because my cows get shot. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, well, yeah, I don't blame you, you know, in that case. And it's how do you get over that hump? And a lot of cases we find it easier, at least from, being a bow hunter perspective, right? If we're in there saying, Hey, we want to bow hunt. That seems to be a hell of a lot easier to get access to a place than if you're coming in and wanting a gun hunt or something like that. Turkey seems kind of in between. And if it's for a, li a limited time too. So sure. like if you're a non-resident, I've noticed some of the South Dakota guys that I've called the message that I leave first is, Hey, you know, this is who I am. We're from Southwestern Pennsylvania. My friend and I are looking to, you know, just come out and archery hunt mule deer for like three or four days. You know, I don't know if that's something you'd be open to or not. And I've gotten multiple call back, you know, being like, yeah, you know, it sounds pretty harmless. Yeah. That's something we'd be open to. And yeah, I guarantee if you were saying about guns and bringing yep. a group, then instantly it'd be the, the one thing that we're rocking that scares some people away is camera gear. Yeah. Is, did you get that feeling from that guy? Cause I mean, you, I assume you guys were filming Yanni on that stuff, right? We were. No, he didn't seem he didn't seem too worried about it. I mean, most people we just tell them like what we're doing. We don't <clears throat> we don't just walk up to him and start filming him, right? You sure. know, but we have the cameras and stuff with us. You know, we're just packing around those little bitty Sony's. That oh, are, that's cute. You guys have like a YouTube channel. Does like anybody watch your stuff? <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty much what they say. They're like, oh, you guys put videos on YouTube. What what's your channel? And we tell them, and they're like, oh, okay, I'll have my nephew or my yeah, brother. Yeah, I bet he'd like to know whatever. about you guys. I I think yeah. that this is primarily those Western guys, the what the Western guys yeah. with with trophy animals because they know what they've got and they've gotten pressure from people asking us. Like even in the Midwest and stuff, I don't think it's that big of a deal because it's just you know, sure, there's just deer kind of everywhere but out in the midwest where they've got more herd animals especially even elk and stuff mm -hmm. like them guys are like yeah i don't want you filming out here like this is we try to keep these pretty exclusive well and i think right. that the other pressure is the outfitter thing and i don't think that's from a necessarily yeah. like um uh, pressure of us hunting on there as much as if an outfitter catches wind that they've got a decent you know yep. population of animals they're going to pressure the hell out of that landowner to lease it out to them yeah. they'll just con they'll be relentless and when those guys live all in the same town yeah. especially small like that's just gets brutal like the guy in in uh, north dakota that we hunt by who's an outfitter i guarantee he just pressured and pressured and pressured and pressured until he finally got that piece of ground you know oh, that is a piece yeah. of ground too dude it I, is it's the right i've been piece. looking at that oh just even behind like uh, they own every bit of good deer country right there mm -hmm. that one and I mean, those. that's, those guys are making a business out of it. And it's weird. Cause there's like, there's some really good outfitters that we know, but there's some just bad ones too, that are just, you know, they put a lot of pressure on those landowners. And thus, I think you get into these cases where people don't want to lease to you or they don't want to let you have access because they've had bad experience from an outfitter standpoint, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's the outfitter themselves and or the hunters that they put on the property from an outfitter. It's a, it's a weird like third party thing that, mm -hmm. that outfitters deal. It's like, you're not just running into other guys hunting, you're running into people who have, are making a business out of mm -hmm. getting the permission and yeah, and the then monetizing you're trying to hunt. It. Yeah. It's kind of odd. Well, it's, that's what's kind of broke this lease game that we're all kind of dealing with in that, you know, people will say, well, man, I don't want to pay 30 bucks an acre for a lease. And it's like, listen, that outfitter will come in here and drop 15 grand on that property. And then he'll turn around and make 30 on it mm -hmm. by leasing it out for hunters. So, you know, it's, it is, it's, uh, 
And it's only in certain parts of the country, I think, that you see that. But, you know, it's it's definitely something that these landowners are, are having to deal with. And some of these people, you know, they don't know what they have. But the thought of, you know, letting a bunch of people hunt on their property when they've got cattle and livestock is, is not attractive. I think um, just a comment about leasing is, like, obviously we do it, and I think it mm-hmm. is – it is what it is, but <clears throat> I don't think that it necessarily gets you access that you couldn't get anyways. Sure. I think it does a better job of making sure that you have exclusive access. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, what we've done, Aaron, is a lot of our leases are bordering hard to access public. Um, sure. In fact, my buck that I killed in Kansas last year was on public um, yeah. but the only reason we kind of knew that deer was in the area is cause we lease ground around there and we had them on camera a lot. And it it's was usually where we start. Yeah. We, we we'll yeah. lease a piece of ground and then it's like, all right, what well, public is in the area? And then it's like, okay, mm-hmm. now we have this much to hunt with mm-hmm. this core ground locked down. Yeah. We've leased in, we leased in Illinois this year. We have a nice piece of ground, but it bumps up to Shawnee national forest and a lot of really tough access kind of ravines and stuff that we saw a lot of big bucks on. In fact, one of our cameras is on the edge there of our lease and there's some decent bucks pouring out of the public, yep. you know, onto our property. So it, it's kind of a strategic move in that if we lease a piece of ground, it's typically more for access as much as it is a hunting spot, mm-hmm. you know, to get into sure. some of these pieces. Um, but I think that, you know, the option of asking and trying to get access to some of these landlocked pieces is just as important. And people just either aren't going around the right way of doing it um, or they're just, not going to do it. I think they're they like, just don't do gonna it. Say no. Yeah, they're they're just don't no. like realize that they can. Yeah, they're they're like, you mean no. I could just call the guy and ask him to hunt? Like, what mm-hmm. do you mean? <laughs> yeah. I I mean I I totally understand why some people don't because it's a freaking nerve wracking thing <laughs> to walk up to some. Stranger what the worst they're going to say is no. That's right, and that's what I always tell myself. But it's still <laughs> it is I'm that's still funny. like always super nervous when I'm walking up there in camouflage to talk to these people I've never met before. I in my know. Life. I will they, say they maybe they that's not the right. If move. I can walk into their land, you know. Yeah, I think. But it's yeah, the less still something you do. It like I I don't think I I usually don't wear a camo. The if, less if, intrusive. If I can help it, yeah. If I can get on their doorstep and just seem like a regular like nice guy. I always wonder what like the seek one guys experience because they're in a suburban area, like walking up to their house and they're like, Hey, can I like, oh, deer we hunt in will your walk up to anybody, dude. Yeah. He'll walk up to anybody. And it's like, and he'll, he'll get, he'll get permission to hunt 10 properties in one day. Yeah. Wait, is it like, because he literally these... fills up his truck and just goes do, 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 and bounces around asking people. And is it because these people are just naive to hunting? Like it's just not familiar to them. I would assume. I guess. I mean, I mean, in some situations, yeah. Because, like, where you're at in Columbia, I mean, I remember living there. Dude, I wrote letters. I knocked on doors. And it was a lot. I mean, it people were just hunting stuff. Like, it was already taken. You know, seats taken. Yeah. <laughs> you're not yeah, right. you're not getting in. That um, is probably the case in these suburban areas. Is pe- these people just aren't hunting their ground. It's just their backyard. Yeah, they're like, oh, okay. So like, it's kind of overlooked. Don't shoot my place at. I tell you what, dude. It's ridiculous the bucks some guys are killing out of there. Giants. Like, just booners like constantly giants yeah crazy yeah yeah they're cool dudes yeah jake jake and our group will ask anybody he'll just walk up to them yeah. and just be like real chill and don't care well, that's and just... to your point about the camo thing that's definitely good advice um we're just always wearing camo because that's usually all we <laughs> yeah. have, all we have. <laughs> yeah, keep a <laughs> pair of blue trip. jeans in the truck yeah <laughs> yeah i could i suppose uh this last trip i went on i had I don't even remember. I, I probably had a bag full of two or three changes of clothes, and I just wound up wearing pretty much the same camo for yeah. six days. <laughs> I noticed the same thing. We don't do a bunch of trips, but, like, when we went to North Dakota, I had all these different – I was like, I'm going to wear this probably the first two, three days. You know. I wore the same thing, like, the entire time. I know. That's what Ted does every year. He just has this one pair of Army fatigue pants, <laughs> and he just wears them every single day. Sleep at him half the time. Then you get home, you're like, Ted, we're home from the trip. Why are you still wearing? He's like, yeah, that's all I got. Yeah, that's all I got. That's what I wear. Yeah. yeah. Back when we were this. using tree stands, he would sleep in his safety harness. <laughs> <laughs> he'd just walk in and just crash on just the for, couch. And four hours for, later, he'd wake up and walk right back out the door. Yeah, just emotional security. He's like, yeah, I just feel feel more comfortable. I feel better. On. I'll, just, I'll leave it on. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, man, that's funny. Well, I think when you start to look at like your group dynamic, like you got a guy like Jake, the Wisconsin guy, he's kind of just easy going, do his thing. You know, Zach's high strung as shit. 
right? I mean, we yeah. know that. Oh yeah, he's you know camped up all the time. Yeah, he's a he's he's in a <laughs> he's an emotional character zinger because he's got, he goes all the way up to the very top <laughs> where he's just like on coffee and he's just in the greatest mood ever, and then he can go all the way back down. <laughs> Crashes. Then once he gets back to the bottom, he's just miserable for a few minutes, and then he gets another pot of coffee in him, and he just goes back Straight up. Back up. It's just this constant roller coaster. It always makes things interesting. Mm. That's so funny, um, man. And then you have Greg, who's just straight steady. line, steady, steady Greg. Yeah, he gets you yeah all the time. <laughs> <laughs> he's always there. He, you got him. Yeah, that's it. He's always on the same wavelength. And then Ted yeah, just kind of floats wherever yep, he needs Ted, to be. Ted floats. He's he doesn't say anything unless he needs to, and uh, that's just his way of doing things. And the only thing he wants to do is hunt or fish every single day. I will say with Ted though, like you watch his reactions, like even last year, like killing that buck on opening day. That I love that that, that dude just gets worked up. Like when it, oh, yeah. you know, it, when it's happening too. Like I'm I'm I can kind of keep my composure for the most part until I release an arrow and then I just fall apart. He get like when it's happening, he's he's ho- trying to hold it together. Oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's mean, awesome. It's it's rattling him a little bit. Um, but it was yeah. cool to see some of the stuff. Like even when you know him and his dad were in Iowa hunting, like those kind of dynamic and in, in kind of interactions that you see. You know, it you kind of see you guys starting to find. I guess everybody kind of finds their own little lane there, right? In terms of what they're doing, Zach hunting a lot of that strip mine with the guys back in in Ohio. Like you just start to see how everybody can start finding their lane of like what they do and the, their own kind of storyline, I guess almost. Um, oh yeah, which is yeah. Neat. We have a we have a melting pot of personalities within our group, and I try to let everybody just be themselves. You know, um, that's kind of how. I mean, if. I guess I'm sort of the manager of the group, if you will. Um, <laughs> but I loosely say that. Yeah. Uh, but that's kind of the way that we run things is pretty loose. We just let everybody do their own thing and be themselves as long as they get get the work done that we need to have done. Then I'm cool with whatever. Well, from a from like a brand perspective, obviously, like I came prepared today, and right? I got I got my shirt rocking. Um, it, it, it didn't create. First of all think about like i don't know dude what was it the the 2012 13 14 time frame when we were in iowa working on winky's farm and stuff like to think about like how far this thing has come right what would you what do you think i mean first of all you guys put out a shitload of content but, but i mean so does jeff sturgis and jeff's seen some great growth on his channel you guys have just hit a different cylinder you know in terms of how this thing has grown like like even I was reviewing some stuff for some of these like state proposals and I'm looking like last year and your subscriber numbers just in 12 months, you know, and it's, it's grown a ton, man. Like it's still growing. Um, you know, do you, what are you thinking, um, or attributing a lot of that success to, is it, is it frequency of content? Is it the kind of diversity of your group and hunting style? Like, what do you, what do you think? I mean, and it's no right or wrong answer, right? Cause it's essentially Google's hidden algorithm here on a YouTube front, but like, you know, you're engaging a ton of people They're and they're watching, they're sticking around, they're watching, they're coming back, they're subscribing. Like, what do you, what do you think that you're, you're finding there from a, from a business and brand perspective? I think it's a diversity within our group and, um, the, the way that we go about content is everything has to relate to people. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's easy to do if we're just being ourselves because we're just, you're, we're your average hunters. Yeah. I mean, we always, we always have been. And the things that we focus on are the basics of hunting. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I mean, you can watch our content and you can get into some high level tactics on, for hunting mature deer in different situations and all that, which is interesting to, you know, uh, experienced deer hunters like you guys maybe, Mm -hmm. but we have these, we have these different personalities in young people within our group, uh, that sort of mesh together with what I would say is like me and Greg, who Mm -hmm. are the older guys who've been doing this a little bit longer. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, so you kind of have you kind of have all those different demographics covered from a relatability standpoint. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of high school kids that watch and they love watching Ted because they remind you know he reminds them of 
them. Mm-hmm. Just with a mustache. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> or of like so an I uncle think, that they I might think have. That or has something. a lot to do with it, but <laughs> we focus on the basics of hunting. I mean, you go out, you go hunting for the thrill of the chase. You go out, yeah, and you trying to harvest a deer to eat. You know, you're yeah. going out for adventure. You're going out with your buddies to have a good time with your friends or your family or whatever. And that's always been kind of at the core of what we do. Yeah. So when people see that, whether they're an inexperienced hunter or they're an experienced hunter, or they're even somebody that's just thinking about getting into hunting, they see our enthusiasm that we have for what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why that's why the platform is growing is because we our audience isn't just experienced hunters. Mm-hmm. It's, there's a ton of people that are watching that may just be fishermen or women that are thinking about getting into hunting Mm -hmm. or that are folks from the city that have just started to think about, you know, taking up hunting as a means for food Yeah, sustainable. and they're checking out our Mm -hmm. content, you know, because it's searchable on Google because we're hunting public land just down the road from their house or whatever. in one of these videos. So I think that has a lot to do with it. I mean, that's, and that's kind of, we were, I was talking uh, with some of the guys from bowhunting.com recently about uh, the divisions within hunting right now. Mm-hmm. And we all sort of have these different camps, you know, where we're, where we have these lanes that we're following. But when you look at it from a, you know, 40,000 foot view or whatever, it's like everybody has these four or five common things mm-hmm. that they all hunt for. Mm-hmm. And it's those things I just mentioned, right? I mean, yeah. and that's what, that's what we're always focused on in our content when we're when we're going out there is just showing people basically how much fun you can have hunting. Well, I think that's a big point of it because, you know, we talk about it a lot here. And I mean, you know, it's no knock to a lot of the TV guys, but but there's a different entertainment value with what you guys are doing. Like, obviously, um, you know, in, in many of my cases, just because of who I am, you know, I'm not necessarily interested in going out and shooting a two year old buck. But I sure. like watching your stuff from an entertainment value, but not to where it's like you literally are putting on a commercial entertainment, right? Does that, does that make sense in that there are a lot of things out there where it's like people are making a show for entertainment, but it's literally like I'm watching 30 minutes of a commercial um, yeah. versus like I'm watching your entertainment because it is cool. It is fun. It is engaging. Um, whether the end goal is a two-year-old buck or well, a mature buck, a, you know, that's a good point because our mission statement it basically says like the viewers come first, right, above everything else. Yep. And from the out of the gate, I mean, when we started this thing in seventeen, we we're broke. I mean, <laughs> I had a few thousand bucks. Greg had a few thousand bucks that we pitched in and we bought some cameras with, mm-hmm. and. Uh, a laptop like a refurbished laptop to edit on and i don't know how much money it was i mean it was maybe 10 grand or less Mm -hmm. that we had between the two of us and uh we were working side gigs at the time heck i was still editing some for bill on the side um for the first year or so Mm -hmm. and yeah i mean so when we started this deal there was like no money involved at all right (laughs) and we really had no you know expectations that there would be at any point so the mission statement and it still is the same Mm -hmm. it's always like the viewers and their needs come first so like how do we create value for the viewers today yep and then that's basically how we've went about it every single day like I look at the I look at the numbers and how the brand is growing and all that occasionally, but that's not where my focus is. Every day it's like, well, how do we, you know, create this video mm-hmm. to show people how much fun we're having and to create value for them in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't to your point, Jeremy, it's like our model is not about what do our sponsors need in right. order for us to make money? Right. And then what do we do for the viewers? What will the viewers like after that? The viewers always come first. Mm-hmm. And like all of our partners understand that. Mm-hmm. Like the the sponsors that we do have, we have decreased deliverables with. We don't we don't do everything that we possibly could for them mm-hmm. for the sake of money because that's not our number one priority. Right. And they know that going into it. It's like, you know, 
always where the rubber meets the road is with our with our viewers. And so like and we're gonna do what they want. From like a company and not like diving deep in it, but from a company and a monetization standpoint, you know, you're then putting the forward focus on viewership, which then in at least in your case, you know, revolves a lot around YouTube monetization. Sure. Eventually, yeah. I mean, yeah. if you if you get enough views and minutes watched on YouTube and your videos are monetized, then you can make some money doing that. And we do. Does it make you um, nervous with YouTube you know, right that now? That was kind of a bonus thing going into it. What's that? Does YouTube make you nervous at all on that front? Or are you guys not Oh, focused? yeah. YouTube, YouTube makes me nervous all, every day <laughs> because you never know. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen with them. Yeah. I just look at, I look at YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and all these big tech companies is kind of a necessary evil if you will yes. for what we're trying to do it uh is. i don't i don't like them in the sense that they've got these crazy censorship rules and that you know we have no control over whether or not they're going to pull our content at any point for something that we don't even understand right that's all that stuff is exists but at the same time, these are global platforms of communication. Yeah, it's so your touch point. If you want to participate in basically mainstream communication today, you need to be on those platforms mm -hmm. doing something. And I feel like if we as hunters remove ourselves from those, we're just removing ourselves from the communication. Mm -hmm. We're just going to segment ourselves into this little group over here in an echo chamber where we do nothing but communicate with one another and, and we're not even going to communicate with, with those, yeah, with it's just the rest shrink. of the world, yeah. which is, which is not productive no. long-term. Do you guys so, think about your content in that aspect? You know, especially from a YouTube front, obviously there's sensitivity rules and stuff like that. And I would say you guys keep it, call it pretty clean throughout yeah. your content. But I mean, is that something that you, you guys as a group say, Hey, listen, forward thinking here, like we can't, you know, show X, Y, Z, like keep it clean and you're editing and stuff like that. We do. Um, occasionally we'll put out a video if it's, if it has something to do with like European Mount, for example, which is, sure. can be pretty graphic, you know? Yep. Uh, but it's educational content. Mm -hmm. So if we put that on YouTube, we just won't monetize it. Yeah. Um, there you go. and then YouTube is okay with it Yeah. because it's, Yes, it's graphic. There's blood and all these things that the algorithm doesn't like, but we're not monetizing it. We're put it in it's an educational content piece. Right. So they allow stuff like that so long as you don't monetize it. Yep. Still get it to your viewers, which is who wants it at the end of the day anyways. Yeah. Yep. Makes sense. So. Yeah. I mean, you guys obviously have taken approach. You have partners involved in the hunting public, but, you know, unlike call it traditional um, shows, right? Where it's very sponsor driven. And we've kind of done that with our stuff here and that like we have partners as well and we do things for them. But like, I, I just don't think that the viewer and today's consumer responds well to traditional sponsorships. Like it just, no. it just doesn't they, seem they like have to fit in re really well with what you're already doing. Yeah. Like we get calls from different companies a lot. And if we're not already using their products, then it's at least like a two year window before we're even thinking about a business relationship. So mm -hmm. if they, if they call me and they say, okay, I have this product. I want you guys to start using and I want to pay you to use it. It's like, well, we've never used that before. We're open to trying it mm -hmm. and seeing if it fits, but we don't want anything. We don't even want product. We'll just buy it ourselves. Yeah. That way because you're not obligated. Go through, right. We need to go through the exact process that the consumer has to go through with your product. Unbiased totally. So yeah. we go in and we buy their products and we use them for a couple of years. And if it's something that we think makes sense for what we do and provides value to our viewership, then we'll think about some sort of a business arrangement. Mm -hmm. But these things take, like I said, they take years. Um, we talk with the Exodus guys that make the Exodus cameras for a year and a half Yeah. before we entered into any sort of a like rev share deal on their cameras or anything. Um, that's just one example, you know, mm -hmm. but that's, that's kind of how we operate. Um, and we're minimalists as you all can tell from the videos, we don't use very much stuff. Sure. Yeah. Well, so, and I mean, I think it makes sense. I mean, like, obviously I know you guys work closely with Onyx, like we use on mm -hmm. it, but it's a natural fit. Like, Listen, I want to pull this up and see where my boundaries are. 
That's what yeah. that does. <laughs> like it's not a hard, it's not a hard push, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, I use it every day and was Agreed. using it every day before we even started working with them. Agree. So it made total sense. Yeah. And I think that's important because I mean, you know, far too often that that's where hunting industry has got such a bad name is that, you know, people have just continued to take sponsors or change sponsors or do this and do that. And it's like, man, it's just, you know, the customer doesn't even know what to believe anymore in most right. cases. And there's, I understand some of that because the hunting industry is a very small industry in comparison to a lot of other ones. Um, there, there's some money to be made, but it's not an industry that anybody is getting into to get rich. I mean, we're doing all this because we love hunting Mm -hmm. and that's most of the businesses out there, Sure, you know, within the industry are that way. Yeah. Uh, so in order for them to make it, they have to sell a bunch of ads and stuff like that's just the nature of the beast. If they're going to get into that industry, they have to, to sell as many ads as possible just to pay the bills at the end of the month. And I understand that aspect of it, but to your point, um, there definitely is too much mm-hmm. when it comes to you know changing companies or picking a picking a company this year to work with it's going to pay us you know x amount more than the previous one and that sort of thing like it there's a fine line that you have to walk there i guess is what i'm saying and I there's think- some people that push over that and there's some people that that try to stay within those boundaries i can't really blame anybody for doing either or yeah it's just trying you know to make a mean? living at a job right. standpoint I think the real turnoff with that is guys that are just like, they're lying about it. It's like one company, one year you're like, wow, this is the only thing I'll use and this is why. And then the next year, instead of saying, well, you know, that just business arrangement didn't work out. And so, you know, we were kind of looking at the pool. Yeah, I think if there's just transparency involved with the viewers (laughs) and they felt like. There's just no transparency. It's like, well, you were just saying this and now you're saying this. You're acting like it didn't even happen. Who would I believe? So, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I learned I learned some of that stuff when it comes to dealing with partners and sponsors from Bill, because I when I was working for him at Midwest Whitetail, we were talking about Hoyt archery one day, and he'd basically been he'd shot Hoyts for years and years. I mean, you know, and and he had business dealings with lots of bow companies because he's a photographer. Sure. So he, we would get in bows from all different sorts of companies and taking photos of them and whatnot. But when it came to our business arrangement with Hoyt, that was why we worked with them. It wasn't because they paid the most or anything like that. It was because of the relationship that he had with them, that company, those people, mm-hmm. you know, that lasted way before it even sure. started with Russ Whitetail. Yep. And I think that's the stability that you see from somebody like Bill, you know, is that if you look at a traditional kind of line, like there's a lot of these boat companies switch people, like they change underwear basically, you know, or they're bouncing from this boat to the next. And it's like, you know, I don't, I don't like changing bows frequently. Like once I get comfortable with something, I like to be able to shoot that. Um, But it's kind of the nature of the beast and how this thing has, has kind of developed over time is you know, the hunting industry as a whole is a business, you know, and, and frankly, that's some of the call it the fun sucked out of being in the industry is like prior to being in the industry, um, you know, and even working for Cabela's, like, I just love the hunt. And so you like use these products and you saw these products and you kind of got involved with these products just because it was like, Oh, that's cool. Like so-and-so promotes it. And then you see the behind the scenes and it's like, wow, that's a turnoff. You know? It's pretty depressing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's the tough pill to swallow. So like, and I hate like having conversations with some of the general hunting public or not hunting public, but general public people. And it's like, yeah, like you don't want to know some of the behind the scenes. Like you're better off just kind of seeing and thinking what you think, because there are some things here that, that I think would actually hurt the hunting industry even more if the general public knew how it operated. Right? Yeah. Because it is such a, it's a, it's a weird business of how that thing works. Um, you know, and that's not saying everybody's like that. There's some great people. Yeah. There's multiple ways to skin the cat as far as making money goes. Like we don't, we don't make a large lump sum from any one place. Really. We Mm -hmm. just have kind of figured out a way to make a little bit of money off like YouTube and a little bit from like rev share on products and, you know, a little bit off of our merchandise to where we can pay our small group yeah. and continue to be able to do this because well, the good thing about what we do is it's 
we hunt public land and we travel around using basically just gas and lunch meat. So basically you're saying that Jake and Ted are pretty cheap. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Jake and Ted are pretty expensive. But the gear the gear and the food that they eat is pretty cheap. Yeah. Uh, and to be honest, all of us are like that the same way. Yeah. It's like we don't need we don't need much. I mean, we have a couple Ted when I pick up Ted from his house to go hunting, he has a tote of stuff and a bow or a gun and a case. That's and then we have man. a couple coolers with food and most of the food is stuff that we've killed. Yeah. So which is awesome. It's it yeah it's not super expensive living but it kind of just depends on what you want to do if that's if you're okay with living like that and just living pretty thin and mm -hmm. <laughs> and in that way then yeah it's a really cool lifestyle yeah for sure um we're gonna pause there i'm gonna take a pee break if you need to pee okay. good time to break too much coffee. i'm gonna get a drink yeah well i think it, it it's kind of funny because you see um like i really enjoy uh jake's opening of wisconsin one because like i can relate People to love that well yeah. i can relate to it from a pennsylvania standpoint like opening day rifle was was still is but it was such a holiday you know we had thanksgiving friday we would go to the camp we'd be there all weekend monday was opening day like that was just a major tradition for us and so you see you know jake still have that family tradition i think that's a big thing that people you know, our age are yearning for because I grew up with that and it's faded a lot in the last decade, 15 years, um, especially in Pennsylvania as a whole. But I think that, you know, they see that still kind of exists there and they're like, man, like that's awesome. Like, cause it's a camaraderie aspect. And we talk about that all the time. Like I love hunting. I love bow hunting, even when it's just me in the tree, but I, I yearn for like being able to come back or start the day with, Jared or my dad or whoever else, because that's the whole point is like, I want somebody to talk to about it, about the experience, about what happened or about my plan to bounce off. And so when you see that happening with something like Jake's Wisconsin hunt, it's so cool because like they go out, they're all together, that bar, you can feel that like hunter atmosphere, atmosphere around that bar that they're at, you know, all prepping to yep. get ready to go on that, that morning hunt. And there's a lot of people that would listen to that and be like you know holy hell there's gunshots everywhere it's a war zone and almost be turned off but like to me i'm like that's so cool like i'm excited about that because i know that feeling oh yeah that's one of my favorite videos that we've put out the last couple of years yeah. um is that stuff and then his sturgeon spearing stuff is very similar to yeah that. for sure <clears throat> you know just the camaraderie of that but that in there is some people that that hate on it too in the comments that yeah. to your point that are from a different part of the world that think deer hunting should be done a totally different way. Yeah. But the thing that I think people miss is that Wisconsin, PA, Michigan, those areas, even Missouri and Ohio, um, those areas have such a rich deer mm -hmm. camp tradition. Yeah. Like that's really where our numbers are sitting yeah. as far as hunters yeah like that's that's our bread and butter of those those places mm -hmm. um and that's why is because these economies rely on deer season especially gun season like that yeah so th that's why you see that bar packed with all of those deer mounts everywhere and there's hunters sitting around everywhere it's because it is a holiday mm -hmm. um and i think that's real important for us to keep as a hunting community because that's one of our gems, you know, that's, that's one of the things that brings us together is that deer camp tradition. There's very few people that, that, uh, you know, haven't been to deer camp of some sort that are a deer hunter. Mm -hmm. So they can all identify with that. I think that's why those videos do so well Yeah, um, for well, that reason. And, and, you know, they're going out and they're just having a blast and trying to shoot some deer and hang them up and camp and yeah. Grind them in the sausage and everything else. It's just really fun to watch. It's so cool. I mean, that's one of the, like when we go out to Kansas, like we have a deer camp. Like there's four yeah. to six of us in a camp, and like, like that's probably what I look forward to just as much as being able to kill a big buck is just having everybody together and and literally for seven days just living deer for like, sure. That's all we right. think about. Yeah, I I think that um. One of the reasons that, because I've struggled with deer camp in the past and like having conflicting goals with guys in my deer camp is that sure. um, 
number one, like we have a shared goal. Yeah. Jeremy and I do. And, and your dad does. We're all trying to shoot, you know, mature bucks in, in Kansas. Mm-hmm. Um, also, it's not really a limited resource in that, like, it, it's a herd that, you know, we're all investing in a piece of property that we own together sure. and we're planting food plots throughout the year. Like, mm-hmm. the, there's not a ton of um, barrier to entry in terms of a buy-in that's, you know, putting pressure on how mm-hmm. we manage or how we hunt the deer. So it's kind of the purest form where it's like we're going to an area where big bucks are. Mm-hmm. Our goals are similar in that we're all trying to hunt big bucks. We're all hunting different areas. There's no chances of us really overlapping. Mm-hmm. It's like, for me, like the perfect culmination of like, dude, this is going to be an amazing trip. Yeah. Where in contrast, you know, we've got a camp like where my family farm is in Ohio. And like, we've got guys coming in. There are five or six of us that have been hunting it for several years now. And it's it's just different in that like we've all got different goals some of us the objective is just to be in camp to spend time with each other which mm-hmm. i see and i acknowledge i also have a part of that there's also a part where it's like well you know i've been planting food plots and letting deer these deer pass for two three years and hunting shed antlers and yeah stuff for a long period so i have pressure to fulfill my own goals you know within deer season but also within deer camp mm-hmm. and so that's why i asked you early on about like your objective aaron and like uh, and who you hunt with and which places you're hunting and all of that, how it comes together. It's just, it's a, a journey that I'm on now is figuring out like what kind of deer camp atmosphere am I looking it's for? It's just and different. Like, how do I keep it relative? I think it's different yeah. for yours. Like in terms of Jake's, like I, I would say, and maybe Jake would disagree, but they don't know any of those damn bucks that they're shooting. Like mm-hmm. those bucks are oh. running for their lives. They've never seen them. They're not hunting them. It's literally like they don't even live. They're hunting a tiny property, like little ten acre property. And exactly. a lot of those deer don't even live on the. They're property just getting most pushed. Year. They just get pushed in there. Yeah. yeah. And like that's how I grew up. You know, in Pennsylvania, is I would go to my deer camp in the mountains. I hunted or I bow hunted somewhere else, right? Mm-hmm. So when I went to the mountains, like I may have seen those deer at some point, but I wasn't like hunt, ever hunting those deer. So literally it's opportunistic. Yeah. Well, that's what I've done is like, and it took a couple of years of um, just being frustrated with it to eventually be like, all right, well, this goal that I have of shooting a mature buck off this property just maybe isn't realistic. It's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. So I start to create more opportunities for myself. It's like, I'm going to branch out and I'm going to, mm-hmm. you know, get permission to hunt somewhere else. And like, we'll still keep this and it will be what it will be. And, but the pressure for me to achieve that goal during that deer camp is, is reduced. Yeah. 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 I think it's a big, and that's, one. that's helped a lot. That's your expectations. And I mean, you know, uh, and I'm sure Aaron, you got more places to hunt than Jared and I, but we've, we've kind of expanded our opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> we've expanded our opportunities in terms of places that we hunted mainly because it was like, well, if this does get over hunted or it gets pressured or, or whatever weather's bad, like I need a plan B. Right. And I didn't have plan B's yeah. and plan Z C's for so long. And that's why when plan A didn't come through, it was so frustrating. Cause you're like, this is all I got. This is all I got. I oh, man, I've been there, dude. Yeah. I've been there. I used to, I used to be so freaking stressed about my 10 day vacation when I was in college, Mm -hmm. you know, and I would have these two farms to hunt in Missouri, including my home farm. And that's where I was putting in all that work and running cameras nonstop. And my dad just doesn't give a shit. Like he's just (laughs) like, yeah, I just drove up there on the hill the other day and I picked some turnips and I was going to cook them (laughs) out of your food plot up there. I'm like, dad, those are my that's my big and beastie. You know, that's my brassicas <laughs> for the deer. Yeah. He's like, well, I like eating turnips sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, he's up there farting around looking yeah. for rocks and stuff sounds in like, my sounds food like pots my and yeah. riding up there with his truck, checking the camera every three or four days to see if he's got pictures of a squirrel or a bobcat on it. And <laughs> at the time I'm, I'm just like, you're ruining this, yeah, you you're know, killing me, man. but yeah, as I got older, in fact, there was one there was one experience that just totally changed my mind. I had been putting I had put so much pressure on myself to harvest like 140 inch buck with a bow in Missouri. And this is when I was in college so I, and I'm working through college mm-hmm. at an appliance store. So luckily my boss Marvin at the appliance store was a hunter. So during hunting season we worked nights. Yeah. So we could hunt during the day. <laughs> you know, and I just didn't go to school. I mean, <laughs> even though I should have but I would be skipping school to go hunting. Yeah. And I put so much pressure on myself. I've been hunting all day, like 10, 11 days in a row. And a buck came in and I was measuring him and I, he didn't suit me. And he walked off. And as he was walking off, I'd pull up my binos and I was looking at him some more. 
and I realized, oh crap, that's the deer that I'm back here to shoot. Like I literally just passed up the deer that I had spent the entire fall trying to shoot because he came in and he wasn't at, like, for whatever reason, he just didn't seem like he was as big as I thought he was yeah. on camera. Mm -hmm. And when I realized that I just passed up a seven yard opportunity at the buck that I had spent all this time trying to shoot, I was like, so ticked at myself. Yeah. Cause I mean, so. what do you do in that point? Be when we talk about this all the time, it's like, Hey, I'm hunting this property and I want to kill a big buck. If there's not a big buck on the property. Right. Yeah. What are you doing? If there's not, and, and if like the external factors that you're talking about are affecting that and there's nothing you can do about it, then yeah, it's either time to change your expectations for that property or to find a different area to hunt where yeah. you can yeah. maintain those expectations. But I hit that, yeah, uh, that was the one experience I had where it was like brick wall. It was like, wow, I just spent all this time yep. and money basically trying to harvest that buck. And then he got in here mm. and I didn't even shoot him. <laughs> and so I was wild, just man. kicking my own ass all the way back to the house. And after that, I was just like, I'm not doing that anymore on this place. I'm just going to hunt it with my old man like I used to when I was a kid. And this is just going to be a fun farm yeah. from here yeah. on out. And if I'm going to go and try to harvest a mature buck, I'm going to go do it on public land or mm. on different land that I had permission on or whatever. So I, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of good stuff people can take away from that is just to, to keep it in perspective, like where you're hunting and who you're hunting with, like what your objective should be on, on mm -hmm. that place. Yeah. yeah and everybody's going to have a different mindset. I think that's something that we've let, definitely learned through this whole THP thing is that's one thing we're privileged with is to hear all the different perspectives from the different people that hunt out there or the people that are just interested in hunting that haven't even sure. taken it up yet. It's like you, you might have somebody that is so serious about it that, that, that puts in, you know, 150 days a year mm -hmm. to harvest a certain caliber buck. And then they may have somebody that lives literally right across the street from them that just gets together with their buddies and goes deer hunting three days a year. Mm -hmm. you no, know, but yeah. we're all buying licenses. So at the end of the day, you're, yeah, you're kind of looking at it like, wow, there's this tremendously huge group and it's this melting pot of personalities and people that, uh, you know, basically encompasses hunters in general. Mm -hmm. And the more perspective we can gain, especially as experienced hunters on what everybody else is wanting to do. I feel like the better decisions we can make as a group moving forward, because that's the, that's the rub, right? I mean, yep. when you're, when you're hunting a mature buck, you, you need all of these things yes. to go right in order to harvest one of them. Mm -hmm. And it's a high pressure situation. So, yeah. I, and I feel like that, you know, there's two sides of that coin. Those people that are not serious hunters need to be able to look at that, you know, in the other direction and understand, you know, your perspective on it as well. Mm -hmm. And then we can meet somewhere in the middle. Yeah. That's interesting. I've actually, I don't know if I've ever thought about that. Like well, those I, people trying to understand like what I'm doing. So like I'm in the category yeah. of like, I, you know, I want to hunt and yeah, yeah I want to shoot a mature buck. Yeah, but with you guys though. see the thing is though, is like people in our position, like what you're talking about, we have to explain ourselves to those people. We can't just say, well, I want to shoot this and this is what I got to do to do it. You need to tell them like the reason why I want to shoot this is because I've been hunting for 15 years and mm -hmm. this is my passion. This is what I do nonstop. And I've harvested through all of that time and effort. I've harvested numerous deer. And now this is my goal. Mm -hmm. Like once they understand like, okay, if they really look at it, like, okay, I've hunted eight days in the last four years. And then you say, well, I've hunted 80 days in the last four years. Right. Then it's like, okay, well, I guess I could see how this, this is a little bit different. I almost wonder, I mean, the capacity is probably the wrong word, but like, so like I consider myself a deer hunter and I am thinking about not only how I want to deer hunt, but I also like to think that I understand, you know, why some of these other guys like our dads hunt, you know, they're, they're in it for a different um, you know, they, they want to spend time with their sons, you know, like you and I, and they want to have a group of people out and they want to host and just get, have people enjoy their property and stuff. And so like, I think I understand that. Mm -hmm. 
it doesn't seem like those guys are able to understand, you know, uh, once you've, re you've, you've reached a level of, uh, or you've just thought about hunting so much, you're like, okay, here's now how I perceive it. It seems like that level of understanding would be difficult to achieve if you haven't experienced it yourself. Oh yeah. My dad's stubborn as hell, man. Yeah. He, <laughs> He's yeah like, it sounds like our dad are the same people pretty much. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, but I mean, at the end of the day, uh, he really has always been like that when I'm just, I'm just talking about my dad. Even when I was a kid, he was always like, ah, it's seven 15. We haven't seen anything for 30 minutes. Let's go get some donuts. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I was 11 years old and I'm like, no way, man. Like we yeah. got to sit out here until we see a deer. Got to wait it we out. We see one. Yeah. Yeah. But he was always kind of like that. He was always just your casual hunter, if you will. So I, and to your point, I don't know that he fully understands what it yeah. is that, well, that, that plays that into I it do, as but well, I try Aaron. to explain that context to him. And I, I, I do and think what Aaron, we're doing. that personality plays into it as well. They, sure. may, they may have oh, yeah. the same objective. They just might not be willing to push themselves as hard to, to achieve it. Oh yeah. yeah. And I think it's easier for me to deal with now because we work with a melting pot of personalities. Like yeah. we've been talking about within the hunting public itself, we all have different goals and mm -hmm. yeah and different personalities and different ways that we view hunting. The one common thing is that we all love hunting. Well, I think you there's know, that. My, my intern Gooch last fall, he doesn't, he doesn't care what he shoots. Yeah. He wants to go out and shoot something. He doesn't want to walk around the woods and just pass deer up and do all these things and wait and wait and wait for the right opportunity to yeah. shoot a mature buck. Like he wants to go out and shoot something. That's, yeah. that's yeah. what his goal is when he, when he leaves the house. Well, it's just a weird so. atmosphere because like, I even look back to like how my, my grandfather was, is like when, when deer season came around, he didn't, he just wanted to shoot a legal buck. Mm -hmm. Uh, in some cases, just a buck, even when antler restrict restrictions were in play, but that's just how he was. <laughs> it's like every year he just, his goal was to shoot a buck and he would, you know, eat the meat and stuff, but it was just, it wasn't because he needed the meat as much as like, he just wanted to shoot a buck every year. And there's a lot of people out there. I mean, I know guys who have bow hunted in Pennsylvania for 20 plus years. The first legal buck they see, they will shoot every time. Mm -hmm. sure. And it's, yeah. it, I, I will say that I have a hard time understanding that. I mean, I get the rush of bow hunting. I get the excitement around killing a deer. In fact, I'm kind of the opposite. Like I hate shooting a deer on opening day just because then I'm like, I'm done, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't yeah, want to yeah. be done. Mm -hmm. So it's, I don't know how to understand and I'm okay with that. And maybe they don't understand why, like I pass 40 deer in a year just because I'm trying to kill one deer that I've never even laid eyes on personally. Well, and that's why I say, like, I think the personality part of it plays into it in addition to like the, the opportunities that a person has is like, not everybody needs to feel like they need to improve on sure. success. Whereas, and it almost sounds like I'm like, I don't think I, I'm better because of that. Whatever it is that's in me is like, I, okay, I did this. Now I want to make You're it just harder. Challenging yourself. I want to challenge my, I want to do that's this. It? And so I really do struggle to understand that mindset of like shooting. Let's just say it's a two-year-old on my farm, my family farm, like year after year, year after year. Eventually, like my mind is telling me like, dude, doesn't that like get old? Or like, I don't understand how you're experiencing the same satisfaction from that mm -hmm. year after year. Sure. Well, I think though, um, to your point about that, I was thinking about this recently, actually, because somebody was asking me, well, how come you're so serious into turkey hunting? Like what's so special about turkeys? Because I yeah. just lose my mind over turkeys. Yeah. And, uh, I was like, well, man, I'm Help really us competitive understand. against a turkey. Like I, yeah. I want to go out there one-on-one -on -one and be able to call in that bird or get close to it or whatever. Like, I'm not competitive against other hunters, but I want to challenge myself to hunt turkeys in all these different environments because I am against turkeys in mm -hmm. that sense. Mm -hmm. Like it's me versus them when we go out there and try to hunt them down. But I thought about that in relation to like sports growing up. Yeah. I could care less. Like I, I played basketball and I enjoyed it, but I could never get that. I just never had that passion for it mm -hmm. to where I could go out and I could work at it every single day and just try to continue to get better mm -hmm. but i loved going out you know to the gym and playing three on three on wednesday nights or something well dude that's, but i never I, I i guess my point is, is that those there. people that you're referring to those people that you're referring to that are 
um, okay with shooting a two year old buck every year, they may have something else. Sure. You know, that they're super passionate about that's right. totally different that they feel the same way about like you do about deer hunting for sure and deer hunting may just be their escape yeah you know that's mm -hmm. like with me music is my escape from everything else mm -hmm. like i love playing music and listening to music but i'm i never take it so seriously as i do with my hunting stuff yeah. um because it's just kind of a different thing sure that makes sense yeah i think that's a good point i mean because ultimately when you start to look at that like here it is, whatever, May 20th. Uh, like, I'm studying Velvet Bucks hardcore right now. Yeah, and I'm sure. excited about it. Now, given I was turkey hunting this morning, and, and I was in birds, and I was excited about that too, but the moment I stepped back out of those woods, or the moment I was walking through my food plot, I'm like, man, this kind of sucks. I need to be thinking about what I'm planting here in the fall. Like it, And I'm sure there's plenty of people, like the guys who I know want to go out and kill buck after buck after buck every year, they're not, they're not thinking about deer hunting right now. In fact, maybe they're trout fishing or maybe they're crappie fishing or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, and I do those other things. Like for me, uh, like I love crappie fishing. That's my escape, but I never take it so serious to where I'm like thinking about my equipment and like trying to compete right. in tournaments. And so I just like to go out, catch fish and eat them. Like it's just fun. Yeah. I think different animals, maybe this is going to sound wrong too, though. Like I think, <laughs> Because it's probably not the right way to say it, but like I think different animals deserve a different level of maybe not respect in terms of their life, but like there's different intelligence levels that these animals have. Like a, I think like I think a a deer maybe is not smarter or intelligence maybe the wrong word, but like it's what is the term that you'd assign to this? Like a deer to me is more majestic, has more understanding. I would say a mature than a, buck is more intelligent than most of the other animals that you would hunt. Okay. Then let's say, let's yeah, use including intelligence. Including the then. hunters in the woods. Let's use intelligence. <laughs> yeah. Then. A mature buck is pretty damn intelligent. Too. Right. Yeah. Let's say a For deer sure. is more intelligent than a turkey is more intelligent than a crappie. Yeah. And sure. so they're also, but, but to Jeremy's point though, like what he just said about fishing tournaments, yep. when those guys go out there and they are competitive crappie fishermen, oh, dude, yeah. they're nuts. Like, they know so much more than I do about crappie fishing. It is insane. Yeah. Like, dude, they they're go picking to a pocket of water and they could identify because of the water temperature and the cloud cover and all these things, like where well, that's, a group of fish is sitting. That's and exactly like, it, man. I'm on my hook and throw it in the water. I'm, yeah. I'm you know? looking at a big pile of a brush pile with all these crappies in it, and I'm like excited. I'm like, man, this is awesome. They're looking at it. They're like, yeah, there's nothing big in there. I'm well, like, and it has what? to yeah, do with no 14s in there. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what no are you talking about? No, no, I just want to catch all of those. I think it has to do <laughs> yeah. with quantity yeah. somewhat too, though, because like you don't hear of any crappie fishermen fishing for three years after a specific crappie Correct. it's like i finally yeah, sure. got on my hear that. my yeah. seasons mm -hmm. is, is and then turkey i think is somewhere in the mid yeah it progresses for I mean, whatever reason and this is not right or wrong at all like i am just wired to hunt the what i think is the most intelligent animal and i will pass on whatever for several years and i just cannot relate to you know frankly turkey hunting from that aspect but certainly fishing from that aspect mm -hmm. but i also understand that there's guys that live or die by it so it, that's yeah, what I'm saying. it's, it's not right thing. or wrong it's yeah. just weird that we're wired that way yeah absolutely yeah i think there's something cool the, the problem is my dad looks at mature bucks like he looks at crappie he's like oh, i'll get another one <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah and I mean, right. There's not another one. <laughs> yeah, there's I'm one. like, there are no more, dude. You just killed it as a two year old. <laughs> but there is a there is a managing expectations there because, like, I will say when we go to Kansas, right? There's probably at any given time three to six bucks that I would kill if I saw them. Yeah, usually at least. At least when I'm on the mountain here in Pennsylvania, one. There's mm -hmm. one buck that I will. I, it's it's the only deer I even try to hunt. I don't care about the other deer. There are other <laughs> bucks that are good deer or mature deer and some of it is time opportunity like i have more time because i'm here yeah. than i do in kansas but it's also like i guess kind of like you're saying warb in terms of the turkey thing like when i hunted that buck last year on the mountain first of all it was a giant it's the fourth year i've been trying to kill this deer like there is a one-on-one -on -one challenge though i've never laid eyes on this deer in person there's a one-on-one -on -one challenge that's happening whether he knows it or not I'm playing chess with them. I'm mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to kill this deer. And at the end of the season, when I don't tag them, I'm disappointed, but I'm also like, damn it. Well, but what would be the alternative? <laughs> how did you do? The alternative is you shoot a smaller buck and the accomplishment is 
And see, guys get real touchy about this, but like in my opinion, the accomplishment is less because there's fewer of them, and it's not the deer that you it's set just, out to hunt. It comes down to what do you what is success to you? Yeah. If it's exactly I want to kill a buck. If I just want to kill a legal buck, and there's plenty of guys out there, plenty in the state to do it. Cool, you did it. Like exactly. that's great. I don't blame me. Don't call me a trophy hunter either, just because I want to kill a mature buck. Because I'm not a trophy hunter in that sense. Like I will eat the. I'll eat an eight year old buck. Well, I don't yeah, care. what's wrong with hunting trophies? Eh, I it, don't like it eating gets, deer. There's a negative mm. connotation around trophy hunting. Like yeah. the fact that I'm only out there to kill the biggest animal. To me, I'm out there to kill the king of the forest because he's the hardest to kill. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes sense or well, not. Well, what makes him a trophy too? That's, I think, what's interesting. Yeah. Now, given yeah, it kind of all depends. Given just depends on the person's perspective and their personality and what they're what they want. Yeah, like I feel that challenge. That's what I like about deer hunting is the chess match that you're talking about. Yeah, man. Because there's certainly a lot of time and effort, at least a lot of thought that goes into how you hunt those animals because mm-hmm. they're just different than the rest of the deer in the woods. Yeah, for um, sure. But with turkeys, like. The, the reason why I love turkey hunting so much is because if I go out there, it, it's just a different thing. Like you said, Jared, it's like when I'm hunting a mature buck in the fall, I may spend all of that time thinking and hunting that deer for one moment of just absolute heart pounding ridiculousness of yes. him coming in. That's yeah. it. But when I go turkey hunting, I get that heart pound and ridiculousness about every other day. Right. Because I'm because that's just the way I'm wired. Like when a bird is coming in and he's getting close and he's gobbling, I can hear the air in his voice and I can hear him spitting and drumming and stuff. My heart rate is just jacked. So hmm. I get that sort of rush from turkey hunting way more in a given year than I do from deer. But I know that's not the case for some people. Some people go out and shoot a turkey and they're like, "Man, eh, that yeah. was kind of cool." But I didn't get the same rush as I do doing other things. Did you have somebody as you were coming up that like really uh, embedded that love for turkey hunting in you? I mean, did you have a relative or a? No, not not really. It was just it just kind of came naturally. Um, Dad was not a good turkey hunter, <laughs> and he's the <laughs> one that took me. He had never shot a turkey when I, he was taking me turkey hunting when I was a kid. So it was literally. Yes, me, a eight, nine, ten year old kid, and an adult man out there. Um, which literally anything else that we did in life, he was my person that I would ask, like, how do you do this, dad? Yeah. Or what do we do next? Except for turkey. There's literally hunting. two of us out there, a kid and an adult who neither of us had any freaking <laughs> idea what we were doing. Yeah. And it was really fun figuring that out with him. Yeah. Um, because it was it was like you know, we spent years before we even killed one. Yeah, isn't that and then crazy? I shot man? A turkey, and then he was like, "Holy cow! They, you know, they exist. Here, yeah. here is one. I've been hunting them for ten years. I've never killed one." I did yeah. the same with I my actually, dad. Like we were very. My dad was like, I used to watch him right alongside us. Well, he, like he was very big into bow hunting. That's how I got into bow hunting right away. Like I shot bow long before I shot gun. Um, but turkey hunting was just something we kind of did because we liked to hunt. Yep. But it wasn't like deer hunting. Like that was just a different thing for us. And like I can remember, like I don't know when the last time my dad killed a gobbler was. Like mm-hmm. I remember years, like when I was a little kid, him fall turkey hunting and shooting a hen. I remember seeing the pictures and stuff. And we turkey hunted, but like the success just wasn't there. Did we get into birds? Yeah, man. And we had some awesome opportunities and encounters. Did we kill anything? No. You know, but we still had fun doing it. And yeah. it it was that kind of release. Now, given if we had those same heart pounding encounters and we didn't kill deer, we would have been disappointed because we took that so serious. Yeah. But right. from a turkey side, it was just like, damn, man, we heard eight birds this morning. We can get shit, but it was fun. Let's go trout fishing. <laughs> like that's just right. That's just kind of how that's it was. That's the way I started out too, was was that same kind of low pressure situation on turkeys, but um, to, I think to answer your question about why I'm so serious into it now is because as I got older, I got more invested in the vocalizations sure. of turkeys yeah. and like what they meant, how they communicate with one another. Mm-hmm. I started going to calling contests and those things are probably pretty boring for the average person to watch. But for those of us that were participating in those calling contests, like we are fully investigated in the language of the wild turkey. Yeah. Like we listen to 
turkeys. We go out and record turkeys. We make calls till one, two in the morning at home trying to sound like turkeys. Mm -hmm. And the more I started doing that and meeting those other types of people and then traveling the country and hunting them in all these different habitats and environments, that's definitely what has ratcheted that desire up to hunt turkeys. Like I love hunting them. And but just because I get to hunt them in so many different areas and so many different places, I get to do the same thing with deer, but not quite as much. Like I might go to three or four states a year to hunt deer. Mm -hmm. I might hunt turkeys in 10. That's crazy. You know? uh, but I, I think I love them equally. It just kind of depends on the time of the year. And the thing that trumps turkeys and deer is elk. Yeah. Like I said earlier, if it's September and I got a buddy that's with an elk tag or I have an elk tag, I'm going to drop everything I'm doing and go elk hunting and yeah. focus solely on that for a short period of time. Yeah. Then I'll come back to the deer stuff. I, I think you just have this spectrum. Like you could be out there like literally key calling and like, you know, making the best approach on a turkey. And then my grandpa will come by in blue jeans with a box call, rap, 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 yep. you know, and it's, you're literally yep. both in the woods making this turkey gobble. One's going to be successful and one's probably not, but you're both doing the same thing and having the same experience. I, I would. Right. But I mean, even relatable to the deer hunting <laughs> stuff that we were talking about, the challenge uh aspect of it and the amount of time and effort you put into it is different yeah like my dad's gonna go turkey hunting once a year behind the house for three hours <laughs> yep yep you know that's what he's gonna do if i go turkey hunting behind the house on our farm i'm gonna go until i kill one of them yeah or until i mess them up yeah you know i'm gonna go until i miss them or kill them yeah that may take five hours that may take 30 minutes that may take five days mm -hmm. but i'm committed to doing that and whereas dad's like, yeah, I'm just going to go for a couple hours and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. And there's some people that are like that with deer hunting as well, where it's yep. like, yeah, I'm going to go out on opening day, hang out at a deer camp, shoot a deer. But then there's the, then there's the next guy that's like, I'm going to be out here every single day until I catch up with this one deer. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Both still in the hunter name label, right? Sure. Which is so, so critical with where we're at as a community and that like, there's this hunter shaming going on that is there's no room for it mm -hmm. right the fact is is like you might be thinking about turkey for nine months a year and working to it and working on your calls i'm going to look at my my calendar and be like oh shit tomorrow or tomorrow's the opener like hey boys you want to go hunting and we're going to walk out and i'm going to call shitty with my mouth call and try to kill a bird and yet we're all still in the same group and for some reason there's a a, a portion of us that just feels like they have to like point it out like and call it out and it's it's yep. so weird that we're like in it it's like listen we already got enough to deal with from the outside world here i don't need you telling me that like i don't know what the hell i'm doing or i don't belong in the woods because i don't think about deer hunting as much as you do or i don't think about turkey hunting as much as you do or i don't <laughs> take it as serious as you do and it's just a weird thing like there's internal discussions that i, mean, I think it, it are healthy make sense though like you, you can look at it and understand why that conflict exists oh i agree because yeah. there's a there's a shared resource with all kinds of varying objectives and levels of effort being invested mm -hmm. it, it makes sense why that conflict exists i'm obviously not in favor of it i think it's a big problem at the macro level when you look at you know yeah. hunters versus or you know Yes. Lobbying for anything. Antis. It's, it's a huge thing. I just, I don't understand why. Um, and, and I'll be honest, like I was, I was, I'd always be frustrated. We talked about this last time with the amount of people hunting on public land and stuff. And like, last thing I want is to be working a bird and see another guy get in between me and him and be like, damn it, man. Like you knew I was doing this. That's just not well, what it happened. And be right? honest though, like if you invest in, you know, years and years or even hours within a given season to kill a specific animal, regardless of the species. And a guy wobbles out there <laughs> yeah. and he's like, I don't know, whatever, just a, a, clearly a hack. Like, are you going to not be frustrated yeah, that he kills sure. the I thing will. instead of you? And that's where the luck aspect comes down to like, we, a lot of times as control freaks or as hunters don't want to like admit that there's way more luck that goes into it than I mean, I think really does. I think all of us can easily say like we've all had a buck that we've worked really hard to kill that somebody else who probably didn't work nearly as hard ended up killing. Yeah, right? yeah, it's not Constant. it's not a direct reflection. Like we play this game with mature bucks, 
almost like we play it like it's a sport. Mm -hmm. But if you, yeah, if you have the best basketball team, for example, and if you are the Chicago Bulls mm -hmm. and you have the best player and you have the best team, mm -hmm. we're talking about probably, the 90s. Your Bulls odds of here. winning the finals are better than everybody yes. else. And yeah. you've seen what history has done. Like those teams usually win. Yes. I mean, if they don't win, they come damn close. Yes. But with hunting, it's a different, like, like you mentioned, the luck factor is so much higher than it is in these other activities that Absolutely. we do. Yeah. That, yeah. There's certain things you can do to put yourself in the right position. But if you got, especially if you got a bow and arrow in your hand, there's a lot that's just not up to you Yeah. that, that you have to be able to live with at a certain point. And there's some things that you can do to get better and, but the the main thing that I think kills deer is just perseverance. Yeah, yeah. you know, it is continuing to just pound at the rock, if you will, and a ton of luck. Until you get it, and a ton of luck. I mean, yeah, that, that is that's maybe the biggest contrast of any of these would be bow hunters um, as compared to to gun hunters in terms of like the the likelihood of killing an animal regardless oh, of it's scale. Ridiculous. Yeah, well, what we we're mean, talking about with mule deer hunting is like how much how much effort goes into like the observation of like having to sneak up and stalk on his deer. And like, if mm -hmm. it blows out of this little gully or whatever, it's gone. Like you're, you're not, you've missed your opportunity. Whereas if you have a gun, which is a you know, majority of hunters, if it blows out of there, it's like, watch him, watch him. He stop, shoot him, shoot him. Yeah. It's a, and it's a weird thing. Cause it's like, if I look at last year's Kansas buck that I killed on public land, I made a very strategic move to sit into that stand, but I literally got in that stand and in 10 minutes that deer was just walking right up the trail to come right under the stand. And I shot, and it was a five year old plus, you know, 155 inch deer. Man, it's nice when it works like that. Yeah, isn't it? But I mean, and <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd be really lying. Nice. You know, I'd be lying if it said, yep, that's how it's and supposed it's, to it's happen. And it's maddening as, yeah, like, I mean, I'll throw myself under the bus. Like, I'm kind of a control freak when it comes to my no. bow. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah and so but i also realized that that's the way it goes is like yeah. it's, it's just, you gotta get lucky it is i mean seriously though it like i was late to the stand i packed in all my my video equipment with me i set it all up i'm sweaty it's already breaking like, like i'm frustrated i was pissed i was like why yeah. in the hell do i even carry all this shit in with me this is stupid and i hear something and look back and coming down the same trail as this damn deer mm -hmm. and to the point where finally he comes to 30 yards and i'm like that's that deer yeah was I hunting that specific deer? No, I knew he was in the area, but it's just, that's how sometimes it, it tends to work. And in fact, if I put most of them besides this deer, which I probably, again, was kind of luck because I didn't know he was in there, mm -hmm. but I set up knowing what he was going to do after a front came through and he did that exact same thing. Like it, there is so much luck that's involved. We can do so much preparation around it. We can have so much pattern ability around these deer. The fact is, like, it just is stupid luck 90% of the time. Like, I, yeah. I just don't think that you can... These guys that... We had this huge talk a uh, couple of weeks ago, Aaron. Like, we're talking about moon phase and all this and this underfoot. And, and it's like, listen, man, at the end of the day, they just need that doe to drag them in front of you. And that's about as damn lucky as you're going to get. You can't, you can't tell me that you can study all this stuff. And, and I'll even argue with Sturgis on it sometimes. There are definitely peak activity pieces but that sure as shit doesn't mean that if I'm out in that stand that that deer is going to come by me. Well, and I do think over a longer period of time, you'll see those trends stack up. Like I do think sure. that guys that are better hunters or who have more time invested in studying the animals and stuff will ultimately mm -hmm. supersede, you know, what you can do in a single season. But well, and I think they also yeah, are probably I, hunting. I will say like within our group, like you can see all these different personalities and kind of these different, uh, mindsets to hunting mature deer and i'm kind of a control freak like you jared like i, I kind of i like to be i that's the way my brain works i'm like okay if i'm up five minutes earlier that tomorrow morning than i was the morning before that that means i can get into my stand i can have everything ready you know before daylight i have to have my bow waxed i have to just go through all of these little minor minor details yep. and have all that stuff nailed down before I go into it. I mean, when we go on these trips, I'm thinking about like how much sleep we're getting on average per night so yep. that we can mentally function at a high level. During <laughs> and the isn't, day. isn't that a big Ted part of Jake the fun not for you? thinking about that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, telling you, yeah. Zach is not thinking about that, yeah. but at the same time I've went with them and 
Jake's mindset is just kind of like, I'm just going to go, you know, when I feel like it and I'm going to try to spend as much time as I can out there. But Jake doesn't take anything seriously. Or, or I shouldn't say that. He did, takes very few things super serious. He's when it, he goes into it with a different mindset. He's like, well, why am I so worried about getting in there 30 minutes before daylight if I show up an hour after daylight and that's when the buck's there? Yeah. And he's like, he just kind of lets things go with the flow. And to be honest, at the end of the day, he ends up having as much success as I do. And it's kind of a wash across the board. We all are kind of equals if you will mm -hmm. as far as what we kill mm -hmm. um in perspective to how much time we spend like the time and the effort is what was where the rubber meets the road so yeah if you're a control freak and you're and you're thinking about these things like you have to do you have to cross all these boxes before you get to the woods but you can only spend one day a week mm -hmm. but then you have another guy who's who would is what you would consider more sloppy, but they're just going with the flow. If they have five days, yeah. the odds of them being successful is higher. Yeah, for um, sure. Just because they have more time in the woods. But I've noticed that just hunting with these guys over the years is like, man, I would, and I will tell that to Jake and Ted all the time. It's like, man, I would not step on that stick right there. <laughs> like, I would not do that. That drives me insane. <laughs> but they go, they go through the woods like that and, I mean, they they end up in opportunity sometimes because they're not overthinking things. Yeah, where I am overthinking them, mm -hmm. and then there's sometimes when I go in there and it's total luck, like what you're talking about, Jeremy, and a buck walks right down the trail. It's like, huh, that was great. Do you and think then that there are times where you go in there and you make one die on purpose? Yes, you know, and everything works out the way straight that straight to a T. Do you yeah, think right to a T? Do you think some of the I won't say carelessness, but let's say not overthinking um make makes them hunt more aggressively because let's say like yep. zach zach hunts aggressively we know that do you yep. think that with ted and jake just kind of not over in like i know jared and i will do we'll be like hey here's the bedding area here's how we're coming in here's what the wind has to be wind's not doing that shit we can't really like we shouldn't hunt this do you think they just kind of going in and with the flow makes them be more aggressive? Because that's the one thing I will say that I probably have missed more opportunities in the last five years, especially because I've been super conservative, particularly up until November 1st. Like in October, yep. I won't put pressure on those deer because I'm like, eh, I got time. And mm -hmm. then next thing you know, it's November and it's over. And I'm like, shit. Well, they, they kind of are all different. Even Zach, Jake, and Ted, uh, they're all different amongst the three of them even. Um, you know, Zach will make a lot of mistakes in pursuit of trying to learn something. Mm -hmm. So he'll go out there and he'll be like, oh, yeah, the wind's dead wrong. And I'll look at that spot and be like, yeah, you're going to blow the deer out of there. And nine times out of ten, he's going to go in there and he's going to blow them out of there just like I thought. But he might go in there and he might find an oddball wind current that I never was going to see because I wouldn't have went in there. Sure. You know, and it kind of depends on the. I think both lines of thinking work in different situations. Mm -hmm. It just depends on the depends on the spot that you're in. If you're in there hunting one specific buck and he's in one spot and you've got to think about this a little bit you know, and you just dive in there and bomb him out of there. Yeah. You don't have another, if you don't have another option, I'm saying, then that super aggressive mindset might not work. It might kill it but off. But yeah. he also, he also puts himself in situations as I do. And as Jake does that kind of suit our strengths, if you will. Mm -hmm. So Zach might want to go to a big giant piece of public land where he can go and he can mess up buck A, and he can mess up buck B, and he can mess up buck C, but then everything comes together on buck D, and he kills him. Right. You know, where I might end up on one or two bucks on a little bitty area where there's no other people that I've seen, and I might try to strategically stage hunt in there on top of those deer. Mm -hmm. uh, either one of them kind of works, to yeah, be honest, in, in achieving sure. your goal. Uh, Ted and Jake, I think, are a good blend of the of both. Yeah. Because they don't overthink things. Ted is Ted is getting really good at like just following his instincts when he gets out there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something I was talking to him about not too long ago. I was like, man, you better keep that. Don't mm -hmm. overthink the shit out of things like I do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, there's some things that I think about that you guys don't that you can probably learn from. But your instincts are really good in the woods. Mm -hmm. And if you trust them while, you know, 
using a little bit of this thought ahead of time, mm -hmm. you'll probably be better off. Got to be and in the you game. Can see that. Yeah, I think yeah. that's good advice. I, I think something that's really helped me, Aaron, and I assume is something that you um, came to the realization of at some point as well, is that there's things that you can control in hunting and there's things that you, you can't. And yep, I think for a right. long time, I tried to control all of it from how the deer were moving on my property to, um, you know, when they were getting up and doing certain things to how the neighbors were, you yeah. know, hunting around my property. And none of that stuff is in my control. It's completely out of it. In fact, that's why so much of it is luck. But there are still some things relating to like uh, my gear and, you know, how I'm operating um, mm -hmm. in my thought process and stuff that I, I can control. So I've kind of retreated to controlling what I can and getting enjoyment out of that aspect of it because I do like the gear prep. I like my things to, to work well. But I also realize that I have almost no control over, mm -hmm. you know, all these other things. A lot of luck. And, and I've come to enjoy hunting a lot more because of it. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, I think there's just sure. less things to be disappointed about to that's where it. it's like, that's oh, it. my God, like it didn't work out again. And it's like, well, dude, yeah, it's 80 degrees out. Like the deer aren't moving. What do you want? What do you want to do? Well, exactly I always it, take yeah. myself back to that mindset I had when I was 11 or 12 years old. Um. And I try to, I mean, that's a long time ago now, but I try to think back to those days mm -hmm. as often as I can, especially when you're on, you know, a grinder of a trip and you're nine, 10 days in and yeah. you haven't seen anything for five days. And it's like, man, I'm coming down to the end of this thing. There's a good chance I'm not going to fill a tag here. Mm -hmm. uh, but you think back to those times when you were just getting started and you weren't worried about any of this stuff. It was just pure enjoyment that was all it was. Mm -hmm. And it was like, man, here comes a doe down the trail and your heart's pounding. Yep. I know it's hard to put yourself back in that box because you've progressed over time into what you are now, but it's always important to remember where you came from in mm -hmm. that sense, because that, you know, that's ultimately what we're all about is the adrenaline rush and the, just the love for being outdoors and that sort of thing. And if you can always keep a little bit of that, in you you won't it won't stress you out near as bad so i think that's a i, I want to ask you this point because this is obviously a new change for you but um and something i've been working on so so bethany's got two boys yep miles and graham seven and nine so now you've how got you, how old are your boys uh nine and five nine and five yep so now you got two two to mentor right yep is that weird for you that Aaron's got boys older than you, <laughs> older than yours? <laughs> yeah, that is, huh? How about that? Uh, well, I'll say this. First of all, and, and the reason I bring it up is because I have Im embedded in my brain how I hunt, right? Now, my season, no, I won't say doesn't matter because we have planned trips that the boys aren't on. But when I'm here, I have to shut that entire thinking off because I'm like, man, just put a, a spike in front of me. Like, mm -hmm. I don't care, <laughs> like put a doe in front of me, you know, whatever it is. And so, um, I guess from, from your thinking, Aaron, and I, I again, from travel and, and this being like a business side, like I know I've seen some of the videos that you guys have, they've gone on hunts with you. I don't know. Have they actually hunted on some of those hunts or they've just gone with you? They just gone with me. I've taken miles. Miles has actually toted a weapon one time. Okay. And he's just using a little air rifle. Yep. We were rabbit hunting. Yep. Um, but I didn't film that one. I just took him out rabbit hunting um, at the farm with a little air rifle. Mm -hmm. And we had a blast. Like, we chased probably the same rabbit around the same <laughs> brush pile for literally like three hours with yeah. my dad's beagle. Yeah. Like, he just kept running him in and out of there. And with a little air rifle, like, the <laughs> rabbit has got to stop in an opening at 20 feet in order for him to shoot. It ain't like a shotgun, you yeah. know, where you can shoot at one run and buy. So we just kept trying and kept trying, but he had a blast. No, they've been they've been on a couple videos where they were just on the hunt, you know, yep. where they were helping us track a deer or something. Yep. So is that plans for this upcoming fall? I guess number one, do they have interest in it? <clears throat> oh yeah, both of them do. Mm -hmm. um, Miles especially. He's older. He's nine, and I picked him up from school yesterday, and I was telling him about my hunts to Montana and Wyoming for turkeys recently. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I can't wait till I can go hunting. When can I go? And he asked me that all the time. Yeah. Um, but there's some things that we're going to, we're going to make them take hunter safety mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. before they get out there and do anything real serious. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And I don't know if that, I don't know when that'll be. I don't know if that'll be this summer or next fall. I'm not, we're not rushing it at all. Yeah. You know, their, their dad is still on the fence about them hunting. Um, we've had some conversations about it and stuff and he's open to it certainly, but he's not a hunter. So he's unfamiliar with guns and hunting and all those things. Yeah. That's a tough, so, that's a tough situation. Yeah. And her mom is kind of the same way. She's, she's, she's open to them going hunting with me and I, and the boys definitely want to go, mm-hmm. but we're not really rushing it. We're just kind of, we're just easing them into it. They're sure. going outside with me when they can. Mm-hmm. And we're going hunting a little bit. I'm taking them along on these trips sometimes if it's close to the house or something. Yeah. But as they, I, the interest is there. Mm-hmm. I just want them to take hunter safety courses and stuff first. Mm-hmm. And then we can take the next steps beyond that. I remember my hunter safety course, the guy was like, <clears throat> I, he'd had some, some bad situations with turkey hunting, I guess. Basically what I remember from that was he basically said, if you go turkey hunting in Pennsylvania, you will get shot and you will die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the way it was for me, too. That sounds about right. I was like 10 years old or something. And I was my like, oh, God. In there. <laughs> yeah. And I just could see all these images that they were bringing up of hunting accidents. Yeah. Oh, I know, <laughs> man. Oh, my gosh. I don't even know if I want other, to do this. The other... Dad's like, they're showing you that to – you know, mentally yeah. prepare you for the responsibility you have when it comes to toting a weapon around. Oh, it's crazy, well, the, man. The bow hunting guy, I remember when we got to this section, he's like, if you can't hit a quarter at 30 yards, uh, like 50 out of 50 times, he's like, you don't even think about going in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, oh, man. Yeah, I remember like going, it, it was the gun safety. And for whatever reason, they I, pa- always, I passed that building, by the way, the other day. They always use turkey hunting as like the big example, right? And I remember the guy giving me like a red handkerchief or something. And he's like, hey, hold this for a second. I'm like, hold it. He's like, if you have this in the woods when you're turkey hunting, you will get shot. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, why did yes, you get I remember the red handkerchief too. Yeah, I was like, I don't want it. He's like, no red, white, or blue in the woods. I'm like, really? Mm-hmm. He's like, no, no red, white, or blue. You're get, you will get shot. Yeah, you will die. Yeah. Um, no, I think it's an that's, interesting that's topic. What I got out of it. <laughs> it's an interesting topic because, like, I so my oldest Carter's nine. Um, we turkey hunted a little bit when he was eight but not a lot and i liked it just because it was like birds goblin he had an interest in it like kept his and we didn't hunt much and then i kind of i i think i made a mistake this year in that um he's really good with a crossbow and and for both of those guys like i wasn't sure about the guns and kicking and stuff but he was really good with the crossbow um and so i took him out and i was like okay like i'll just first deer he sees he's shooting right and like i guess that's my mindset like i'm patient i'll wait like we went four right. or five hunts without seeing a damn deer. And it was just, by the time we got to like hunt number five, like his interest was just, I could see it fading fast. And it was like, man, like I, you know, and I'm trying to pick the right days we're in the right spots. And like, you know, it, I eventually pulled the plug on it. Right. Cause I was like, man, his just, his interest is fading on this. I need to stop. And we went back out for gun season and he shot up four point on the second morning and we had action the first morning he shot that in the second morning and and I did a better job with like, Hey, we'll go out for an hour or two. And like, if we don't see anything cool, we'll come back in, eat lunch, do stuff. We'll go back out in the evening. But the deer hunting thing was tough for him because like, it isn't instant action. Like you might get, Hey, turkeys on a roost goblin. Well, you or thought something. it was going to be though. For whatever reason, the deer just, yeah, they just didn't cooperate. They, of course, you man, want to put no. them in a target span rich environment. It's just different than ours. Holy shit, man! It's, it's just so crazy. much shorter. Yeah, it's like when we have a full day with the boys and we're outside doing stuff. It's like there's we're gonna do twenty five things throughout the course of yes. the day. It's like you want to go look for rocks in the creek. Yes. Well, <laughs> then twenty five minutes later, after we have just looked really hard for rocks for twenty minutes straight or twenty five minutes straight, it's like. Let's go dig a hole in the yard somewhere. <laughs> like, okay, let's go do that. Yeah. Let's fill it and in. Then, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, oh, look, the neighbor kids are playing basketball. Let's go over there. And then we go over there and we do that. And then it's like, let's get on our bikes and ride them. Let's ride yeah. them down the hill. You know, it's, it's, it's just one constant. thing after another, after another, after another. Well, and it becomes so, part of them too. So like my youngest, Harlan, who's five, that dude is a straight killer. Like he'll sit with me. Like it, he'll... It doesn't matter if he doesn't see it. As long as he's going to potentially kill something, he's he's happy. You're like, do you want to get out of here? He's like, 
Yeah. We're not going anywhere. Yeah, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> and so, like, he had to sit with me and his brother while we hunted, which, of course, he's not even going to shoot anything. Like, he's just there and was patient and attentive to where, like, after the day after Christmas, he went out and shot his first doe with a crossbow, freaking 12 ringer. You know, the, here's a there's a buck fawn in front of us at 15 yards and a big doe at 30. And I'm like, hey, man, like, just take your time. And I see him, like, turning the crossbow. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm shooting the bigger one. I'm like, why? <laughs> why? Like, that one's right there. It's stupid. Like, shoot that one, you know? And that's what he wanted to shoot. He shot her. And then when we were turkey hunting this year, I had both of them in the, in the blind with me. And, you know, Carter's, like, listening, but he's also, like, kicking dirt and playing with, like, his, like, Velcro on his sleeve. Harlan is actually his younger one. Yeah. Is more right. And he's, things. like, there's, you know, he's, like, hey, Dad, there's hens coming. Like, he's on it. Like, to the point where, you know, I have to almost wrangle Carter a little more. And I wonder, is it because he had several experiences of, like, no action where every time Harlan's actually been hunting, I mean, we've been fortunate to be in them. There's birds gobbling, you know. They both shot the same turkey at the exact same time this year, which was amazing. And how they did it, I still don't understand, but they pulled it off. And it's it's those kind of actions. Like, I know I was always in, in action, I think, when I was younger, when my dad took me out. Maybe we weren't successful, but we had encounters. We heard birds. We saw deer. I don't, I don't know that it is. It, it could be. Uh, we didn't see anything when I, when, <laughs> I, when I hunted as a kid. Like, we rarely saw anything. Yeah. But I just loved it for yeah. whatever reason. I just was like, I'm never going to do anything else. Like, this is just what I want to do. Think, and, and so I, I just sat in cold weather day after cold weather day, not seeing anything and just loving, did your every, dad have loving you, every bit of it. Did your dad have you out a lot like that? Or was it kind of like Aaron said? Because that's how my dad was. Like, if well, it was 730, he's like, hey, you want to go? And I'm like, well, I don't know. You know, we'd walk around a bunch. Yeah, we did too. We we covered we, a we ton would like of ground. Walk around. I'd walk around in my blue jeans. We might go out and sit in a big tree stand or something for a few minutes. Yep. But then if we didn't see anything, we'd get down and we would go find the deer. We you would know, cover that ground. That's what we did. Too. I know something weird. But, I, I don't know yeah. if I've ever hunted out of the same tree as my dad. Really? E ever. I don't know. The first time I ever went deer hunting was with a bow, and it was like we went and hung the tree stand together, and then we hung his tree stand like up on the other side of the property. And he's mm -hmm. like, yeah, in the morning, like, we'll just part ways. You go to your I mean, stand. we sat on I was the like ground 13. mostly. You know, that's like how 13. we initially hunted. Or like when we bow hunted, my dad was in one stand and I was like across the field in another stand. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I wonder if it's, uh, I want to play that. And I, I guess, let's say this is fatherly advice, Aaron. But like there's a, there's a attraction that you see build in a kid. Like Harlan... And I'll ask him, like this morning, I was like, I woke him up. I was like, hey, you want to go turkey hunting? He's like, no. I'm like, all right, cool, man. I'm not going to make him go. Like, I know right. he would enjoy it if he was out there and heard there's birds gone. But I'm not going to make him go. Mm -hmm. And I did force Carter a little bit to be like, hey, man, like, look, we're, going we're going deer hunting this morning. And I, you know, sometimes kids are different. Like, if they, if you force them into something, you know, maybe the attention span doesn't hang as yeah. as much as if they truly are like, Hey, like we want to go. Right. And so if you can continue, and it sounds like in your case, Aaron, if you can continue to build that kind of anticipation with them of like, they want to go, they want to go, they want to go. I think it'll probably be better when they actually do go versus like, yeah, they have an interest and I'm going to take them. Um, yeah, it's all up to them. Um, really. And I've, I've taken them out. We were going to go out earlier this spring just to some state parkland and get up early and go try to call some birds in like no yep. weapons, nothing yep. like that. But I had been watching this group of Toms out on the state park, not far from town. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was like, well, I'm going to just take you, take you guys out there and we'll see if we can get close to them. And they both said, yes, they wanted to go. So mm -hmm. we'll lay it out their clothes and everything. I'm like, now we're getting up at, you know, five fifteen, <laughs> and they're like, okay, I'm going to bed. We'll see you in the morning. And they're like, okay, well, I got up and neither one of them, they were both, they both woke up and they're just like, uh, yeah. Can we go in an hour? It's like, no, it don't work that way, guys. Like <laughs> we go out there in an hour, they're not going to be goblin. Mm. But then I got to thinking about it after the fact. And I was like, I, I ended up not making them go. I was like, yeah. you guys just go back to sleep. I'll go, I'll go see if I can find some of them. I was right, man. But as I was out there listening to birds that morning, I was like, 
I should have just waited an hour and then brought him out here. Yeah. Like I should have just been like, okay, we'll just do what you want to do. Well, you know, if you went back to sleep and if they would have got up and then been well rested and been like, Oh, let's go out looking for turkeys. Then we would have went out and been like, okay. And I feel like that's maybe now because we got to be up earlier. (laughs) I feel like that's maybe like what, and I don't remember anymore, but like, I remember just covering a ton of ground with my dad. Like, we didn't sit still very often, especially turkey hunting. Like, we never sat still. Well, dude, but we just moved. We just covered ground. And I learned so much, man. The sign that I read, the the things that I saw, you know, you pick up a ton. I mean, if you're sitting in a single spot, there's only so much you, you gather. Before we ever went hunting, the thing that really got me, like, wired for it um, was that my uncle, who was a bow hunter, is a bow hunter, um, used to take me spotlighting mm-hmm. in, in Pennsylvania. Oh yeah, I used to do that too when I was a kid when it was legal in Missouri. And it was one of those deals where it was like, well, like th- the family would be at the house or whatever, and like I was just looking for an excuse, like I wanted to go do something. I didn't want to like sit mm-hmm. around and like have family t- family. T- I was like, yeah. I didn't want any family. I was time. like seven or eight yeah. or nine or t- something like that. And so my like at the time, I was like, my cool uncle would come in and be like, hey, he's like, I'm I'm sneaking out of here in a bit to go spotlight. And you want to come? I'm like, yeah. Yep. And then we would go and like we would see these deer. I don't remember if we saw any big bucks yeah. or whatever, but that got me. That that for sure is like the one thing that lit the fire in me. So that years later, when my dad would w- wake me up to say, "Hey, you want to go deer hunting?" I was like, "Yes, up and at him!" Mm-hmm. Like every single time. Like I never had a mm. anything else I wanted to do. Yeah, it's an interesting yeah. thing. It's a challenge nowadays too, man. I mean, with all the technology and games and everything yeah, else, a I lot mean, of distractions. It's, it's a tough thing, you know. S- sports, you know, it's it's tough to get the kids to feel that way about hunting. And you again, you don't want to force them to do it, but it, there's a there's a fine line, and it's just figuring out like just get them out there, right? It, it, frankly, as long as my kids are outside playing, I don't give a shit if they want to go hunting or not. You know, I know at some point they'll want to go hunting. I know at some point they want to go fishing, but as long as they're outside, it's when I see them getting buried in games and devices and things like that. And I, it's not that I don't let them do it. I do, but it gets cut off at a point pretty that's, quickly. It's hard to see, man. I, I've got a, a niece who just seems, I mean, she's a teenager, so i Maybe mm-hmm. she'll come out of it, but she's just totally consumed by like yeah, her. These things are bad. Her device and stuff, and oh I mean, man, they're addictive. Well, yeah. it's Boys like how do you all the time? They they've got limits on. Yep. Yeah. Like, Graham can only be on devices right now two hours a day, and it's hard to compete with that Back when hunting or screens. Period. Like TV, yeah. phone, yeah, you know, Nintendo Switch, whatever. Only exactly. two hours. It's hard to compete yeah. with when when hunting and and anything like outdoors really takes effort and so the mm-hmm. barrier to entry is higher than like opening my device and like i'm, I'm being entertained yeah it's right. something that we even as adults probably have to deal with you're like man i gotta well even nah. in schools and stuff i mean these kids are you know especially with covid like they're on a computer they're on a an ipad or device doing their schoolwork. like it is catering their entire life to be on these devices and listen at the end of the day there's some beautiful things about this i mean you can be out in Wyoming turkey hunting and still editing and posting stuff and be working while you're doing that. You don't have to be at an office doing that stuff. There's there's great advantages to it, but there's such a significant disadvantage into how much time we're spending on these things and not being just outside even. Mm-hmm. Um, right. It's crazy. Yeah. Great. Now, the boys, they love fishing, and we've got some lakes not far from her house that we go to all the time. Um, you know, and I'll just be like, Hey, you guys want to go fishing? And mm-hmm. nine times out of 10, they, they say yes. Mm-hmm. And then we put the devices down and we go. Mm-hmm. So they love, they love being on the water and, and catching fish and they love being in the woods, but they, we definitely do battle with the screens. Yeah. It's a, it's a crazy thing, you know, cause here it is, you know, also us talking about this podcast airing on those devices, your YouTube t- channel airing on those devices. Yeah. Like they're, you know, it is this, how do you find this fine balance? I mean, hell, I know for turkey hunts, it's different, but for deer hunts, like I usually would bring a device with me for the kids because I'm like, well, for the first hour and a half, you're not going to see shit, you know? Mm -hmm. So just chill out, do your thing. And then- And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Or even just, uh, I mean, it's just like too much of a a good thing. Like there's nothing wrong with watching a podcast no. right or you know well i don't care what they they could watch a tv show or a movie or whatever, whatever on there yeah. yeah but when that's replacing you know your desire to get mm-hmm. up and go outside and experience you know turkeys hammering first thing in the morning or 
Yeah, now well, yeah, you gotta have a balance yeah. of everything. Yeah, I was like that even when I was a kid, man. I was all into video games. I would come home from school and I'd play video games for like an hour, hour and a half, maybe. Yeah. But then I'd shut them off and I'd go outside and I'd hit golf balls in the yard or play soccer, or hockey, yeah. or whatever, mm-hmm. or go fishing or that yeah. sort of thing. I just remember when I was like nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I I was definitely into hunting, but I loved to fish. Like that's what I wanted to do all the time. Uh, I mean, in in conjunction with all those other things I just sure. mentioned. Yeah. But hunting was like priority number 10 after all these other things. And then as I got closer to, you know, being old enough to drive, I got every single year, I got more and more invested in hunting and mm-hmm. I spent more and more time going hunting all the time. And it was just this really slow progression over time. And I know that that's different for every person. I mean, that was just my experience was that I came up in a hunting family. So I was always exposed to it. Mm -hmm. And then over time, it's just gotten to the point where I just ratcheted that up more and more and more and more. Yeah. And now as an adult, obviously I have to give up a lot of things to be able to hunt as much as I do. Yep. So I don't get to go duck hunting really anymore, which is something I used to love to do. I used to love to play golf and I don't, I don't play golf as much anymore. That's what we started doing was duck, duck hunting was the first mm-hmm. kind of hunting that I ever did. And, and my dad and I did that together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, we, yeah, we don't do that at all anymore. And really I don't have any desire to. Well, yeah, that's yeah. the weird thing. I mean, uh, there, listen, at the end of the day, it changes there's a, over time, man. There's yeah. only so much time in the day, right? I mean, there's yeah. only so many things you can do. And, you know, for me, I, I like I've always turkey hunted, and, uh, but I'm a deer hunter. That's just what I've always been. It's what I love to do. Like, mm-hmm. I, I, it's not that I don't mind. I, I have come on now later. And I think it's just because of being in this industry too. Like I'm consumed with hunting a lot. Yeah. Uh, and I love it still, but like, I do like to just go out and be that, that dumb crappie fisherman on the lake, just catching whatever the hell I can. Cause it's, <laughs> I, I don't have yeah. to, I don't worry about any, I'm just like, Oh, cool. Where, and listen, at the end of the day, and I, this would be a good question for you, Aaron, cause being in the position you are even more so than Jared and I are like, I still feel pressure. Like if I kill a, let's say I kill a two year old buck, like I killed two year old buck in, in North Dakota, I still feel pressure. Like, Hmm. Wonder what other people in the industry think of me doing that. Do you? I do. And it's a weird thing. I just haven't been able to get over it. Not that I, not that people expect me to kill big bucks. Cause I don't <laughs> most of the well, time. See, and I, I, it, it's a weird pressure. It's yeah. almost like the landowner thing, I guess, Aaron, in a way, like I shoot a buck and I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm excited about it, but there is that thing in the back of my head. It's like, well, people probably think you kill bigger deer. Than this us. is an interesting one because I've got a guy. I, th- first of all, I think it's a problem, not with you, but just, it's not healthy that you feel held to a, a sure. standard by the industry. However, I think it's perfectly okay that you hold yourself to a standard. Yeah. Oh, I agree with that. And there's a big difference. Yeah. And, and I've got a good example of there's a, a good friend of ours that hunts with us on our farm. It's, it's Willie that he's got a big problem with being discontent with an animal that you've shot no matter what. Yeah. Uh, regardless of if it's industry pressure, hunting group pressure, or your own personal standards. Mm-hmm you know, he feels that you should be, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but the way I understand it, he feels that you should be content with that animal and that you, you know, achieved it. I, f- I look at that as like, Hey, if, if I set out to shoot, whatever my goal is, a, a three-year-old buck or 150 inch, whatever the ob- objective is I'm trying to achieve. If I fall short of that, I think it's healthy to feel, uh, discontent with that. Sure. It's in some level. Yeah. I think, I think self wise, I'm okay with it. Like I know when I pull the trigger, whether it's on my release or my gun, I'm happy with whatever I'm shooting. There's nothing wrong with making a a mistake either. If it's not the buck you thought it was, it is what it is. But I'm, if I shoot, I'm happy with it. It's, uh, it's meat in the freezer. I'm, I'm ecstatic. I, you know, it's hunting. That's why I love doing it. There is a way I am now, but I haven't always been that way. Yeah. I used to, I used to, you know, I definitely used to be discontent about it. I, um, but there is anymore, a pressure I, from the I industry, def- though, I feel at least. And it, it's weird because, like, I don't know. I definitely feel sure. that as well. Like, there's there's without a doubt pressure from the industry and just honey, hunters in general. Yes. I mean, when because people, they harvest an animal and they're proud of it. And then they want to show the world what they did. Yes. And then they post about it and then they get all this grief from people about why did you do that? Why would you shoot such a thing if you've already shot X, Y, Z? Yeah. 
and all that, but they just are. Yeah. I mean, it's hard just to say, well, just tune that stuff out because you hear it all the time. Yeah, You can't tune it out, but that's what you, that, yeah, you just have to be able to deal with it and accept what you shoot, you know, and that, that's what I do. I mean, what I, I'm like you, Jeremy now, where I just, before I pull the trigger, I've made up my decision on whether or not I'm going to shoot that thing. Yes. And if I, I get so excited, like I judge it more on, more on like my feelings in the moment than I do my goals. And that's opposite of what I used to do. Mm-hmm. But like I shot that big buck in Iowa last fall and that was an amazing hunt. I learned so much about that deer and just deer hunting in general from that hunt and what we could get away with and what we couldn't that is all really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. But the actual feelings I had in the moment when I shot that buck were not as you would expect. Like I was shaking and I was excited, but I was equally stressed because I didn't see the thing fall over. Right. I remember that's one reason why I love turkey hunting and hunting them with a shotgun (laughs) is because when I put that bead (laughs) on their head at 25 yards, they flop. That thing's on my time at that point. Yeah. I mean, most of the time, that's kind of an arrogant thing to say, because that's not always the case. I've, I've missed one in Iowa a couple of weeks ago, 15 <laughs> steps, yeah. but, uh, most of the time yeah. they're toast. And when you pull that trigger, it's like, boom, they're flopping. It's time to celebrate, you know? So I got, if you watch back at our hunts last fall, I shot a two-year-old buck in Tennessee. It was about as wide as his ears off the ground in some of that urban stuff. And I lost it because I smoked that thing. He ran like 15 yards and fell over. I yeah. just completely lost it. But with that huge buck in Iowa, um, I was so worried and overcome with stress because I hit the deer in a funky spot forward. Right. And I was like, man, I might not get this thing. Yeah. And he ran out of sight. I had all those unknowns. You know, so I really couldn't get excited. And is that pressure on yourself, Aaron, or pressure from filming for the hunting public or both just pressure on myself yeah i i want to my goal is to shoot them and kill them yep. boom yeah yep. and watch them die if i can mm-hmm. like that's i there's Me not too. and i'd say most bow hunters would agree with that oh, like, dude, that's there's, worst feeling there's no can, worse feeling yeah. in the world than watching that deer you know go out of sight or and then, walk off like flicking her tail and walking oh, off yeah. oh my god yeah. i didn't want to throw up man. Yeah, I mean it, it so, and it happens to everybody. You bow hunt long enough, you'll make a piss poor shot, or something won't go right, and you'll have that feeling, and you'll likely lose deer, and it's not a good feeling, and it's it is a feeling of almost shame internally because you're like, Geez. it is, like man, yeah, I couldn't get excited. Gooch was so excited, he was filling me his legs, <laughs> and shaking. he's like, man, that was incredible, and I was shaking too just from the adrenaline rush yeah. of the last hour. But you knew but after the shot, it was like unknowns i mean yeah. i killed the deer it double lunged him he went 50 yards i remember that but... Close, but i spent the entire day just stomach and knots mm-hmm. you know where as that small buck if mm-hmm. you call him small a two-year-old buck in tennessee i smoked that thing and he died right there and me and jake were fist pumping and just so stoked yeah like yeah. there was not a negative feeling in that entire experience of shooting that buck yeah and that's whereas a... of that big big deer i shot with the questionable hit in the front there was a lot of negative feelings going on with that. Yeah, that's just a because good of the situation. That's a good point. That that buck in Kansas over here, I killed the one I shot off the ground and forward. I actually sent the arrow and stuff a picture to to war when we were in Kansas. Yeah, and it was it meant it sucked so bad because like I was snort wheezing, pawing the ground, calling this thing. I've never killed a deer like that, right? Yeah. Shot this deer, went over. I still didn't know where I hit it. Broke an arrow, watched him walk off, and like what should have been such a like unbelievable like this was a like just a raw hunt turned into like am I even gonna find this deer? Did yeah. I just wound it? Like what happened? And it, all those things that then I, I don't want to say kill the the mood, but just completely smother what should be like a very very high intensity yeah. enjoyable time. And I found the buck. Like he went two hundred yards, and it wasn't the greatest shot. I shot him in the jugular. But, like, you just – you go through such record highs and lows yeah. that it's like oh, – That's what it is. It's just the highs and lows. Of yeah. I, I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing that you experience, though. Like, yeah, it's not as straightforward of, like, smash the thing. He's dead right there. Let's celebrate. Like, yeah, that's clean and that's yeah, those obviously have, preferred. Yeah. But 
it's just part of the experience where if they if they do make it out of sight or you know mm-hmm. you make a bad shot which is not ideal but hopefully Happens. you recover that thing and you're either gonna get a sense of relief ultimately or you're gonna learn something and mm-hmm. you know hopefully- oh and you certainly do get a sense of relief when you walk over the hill yeah. and the thing's laying there dead it's oh, like no yeah, doubt. there you go yeah it's just that those those feelings in the in the process of all those things as they happen mm-hmm. yeah. you know they can change so drastically no doubt. but that doesn't happen there that's why that's one more reason why i love turkey hunting it's because that doesn't happen nearly as often in turkey yeah. hunting with a shotgun yeah now you hit and them in the face they go down yeah you shoot them in the <laughs> face and it's time to celebrate at that point and that happens a lot in the spring there are so some that, cool experiences that around it that buck behind your head jared is probably my most memorable hunt of my entire life and it was because the shot wasn't great it was a single lung and we trailed that buck for two miles through the pennsylvania mountains and i had to shoot him again to kill him but it was the first of all it was a camaraderie aspect there were four of us out trailing it um and but like that was the hardest i've ever had to work to find a deer and then to actually recover it was like that's why you put that much effort in it. That's why. Oh you yeah, care you got to so dig deep on those deals, man. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. When you when you can end up in those types of scenarios, it's like you really see what you and your group are made of. Whenever you're that's it, tracking man. deer for sixteen hours straight or whatever. Yeah, and I love. So, yeah, it, man. there's definitely value in learning those things as well because I, a lot of people are in those situations well, year in and year out. That's just the nature of deer hunting. And, yeah. And this is a good example of like. Yes, you would have loved to have seen this deer go down, but you were by yourself. Like you would have recovered it by yourself and mm-hmm. like you would have processed. The alternative is, yeah, you were stressed out overnight and yeah, it took a lot of work, but you ended up having four of us there together that have an experience for sure and got to eat chili dogs after that and drink cores, whatever Coors original, Coors original in the yeah, rain. Man. And like, so now we've got that memory. Yeah. And it is cool to, and, and listen, at the end of the day, as much as I like to make clean ethical shots, I love blood trailing. Like, I, I just, <laughs> like maybe I'll put this one just a I, little far I back. I do, man. Like, there's something about <laughs> just for like, the experience. Well, it's just something about like the primitive, like trying to trail this deer, and like here's a speck, and then you like get to a point, and you're not finding blood, and you do a little circle, and then you're like, boom, I got one drop, but at least puts me in a direction. I like, I do. It's stressful, man, especially I'm if it's my own deer. Glad to I have you. Glad to have you as a friend for that reason, but I hate it. <laughs> I love blood, tra- and it's always been that way. Maybe because I'm a shitty shot, and so I've had to blood trail a bunch of deer. But yeah. like, I I just I like that aspect of it, in that it is something that, and and I think it's also because I've been around a lot of people who don't blood trail well. Yeah. And they're like, yep, you know, we'll, we're not going to find that deer. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, there's blood right there. Like, let's let's go. Let's keep. Yeah. Eh, no, he, he's not bleeding enough. I think too many guys give up on deer too early. There's a lot of dead deer out. You put one in that cavity, a deer's dying mm-hmm. at some point. Yeah, that happens. Yeah, yeah sure. it's all necessary stuff. I mean, it's got to, if you're going to bow hunt, you're going to have those situations. Mm-hmm. I don't care who you are. Yeah. That's uh-huh. just part of the deal. So. Well, dude, what's the, uh, so you're wrapping up Turkey tour now, right? So you got, uh, Maine coming up. Are the boys still out anywhere else? Zach and Jake are in Wisconsin or okay. no, sorry. Zach and Keith are in Colorado. Okay. They're hunting Miriam's down there. Jake and Ted are in Wisconsin for the next week. Got it. Did you guys hunt Pennsylvania at all this year? No, we didn't hunt PA they're this fr- time. They're fired we're, up the right only now. Northeast state that we're getting to this year is Maine. Is that where but is we'll prob- Brett up there? What's that? Brett Joy? Is he up in Maine? Uh, he's up there somewhere. I don't know if we're going to catch up with him and John on this trip or not. Cool. I haven't talked to John for a couple weeks. Old John Lewis. But, yep. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we'll catch up with those guys or not. I'm flying in on the 31st, and I'm only going to be there for four or five days, I think, to round out the season. That'll be interesting, though, man. Maine, Big Woods. That'll be kind yeah, of wild. Yeah, totally different than anything we've ever dealt with before, I think. so. That'd be, be a, a hell of a uh, public land deer hunt as well. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to go up there and snow track for Dude, deer. That'll yeah. be nuts. That I, would, I, I there's watch a, there's a guy at the that. Planet Fitness down here that, yeah. like, he doesn't deer hunt a lot, but all he ever talks about is Maine. And he's like, really? man, I'd love to rent a cabin up there. I'd love to go just for a month or two. He's it's, a good guy. I've watched a lot of videos on it. I can't remember who the guys are up in Maine that I watch, but, like, it looks intense. Are you talking about the guys that jet around on their boats, the sea, bu- sea bucks or whatever? Maybe. Is that what you're talking about? I don't know. These guys were snow tracking. Mm. I want. That's what I want to do. Snow yeah. tracking through the I conifers, want. man. 
Yeah, I want a snow track one. That would be awesome. Yeah, and I mean it's big timber though. I mean people get their ass turned around up in that stuff. You guys have oh, any yeah. any big deer hunts planned this year? Um, uh, no, we haven't really got into that much. Um, we're trying. Ted was just texting me. I guess Wyoming results are coming out right now. He didn't draw an elk tag, but I don't know about the rest of the guys. Yeah. So once we figure out what elk plans are, then we'll we'll start to figure out where we're gonna go. I don't. I don't think anybody put in for Kansas uh, this time. We should hear but, back next week on that, Kansas. Mm -hmm. If not the end of this week. Yeah. End of this week, early next week. Yeah, Yeah. when when was the deadline for that? April it was earlier this month? April 30th. End of April. Okay, end of April. Yeah. I don't think any of our group put in for Kansas this time. We're definitely hunting Indiana next fall, or at least I'm 90% sure. That'd be cool. And uh, we may hunt Illinois. So... We haven't we haven't been to either one of those two states deer hunting yet. So in fact, we've never been to Illinois deer or turkey hunting on THP. I've been to Illinois um, turkey hunting multiple times before the hunting public. Mm -hmm. But that's those are two areas that we're thinking about going. And I would say there's a good chance we'll make some sort of a swing through the northeast in at least a state up there and or the southeast. Mm -hmm. We do that every year. We try to get to one at least one of those two places like we went to georgia last year we went to mississippi the year before that alabama the year before that we also went to pa last year yeah so i don't know exactly where we'll where we'll wind up this this next fall yet but we'll start making plans once we get back from maine cool well if you get illinois look up shawnee and let us know because we got we got some access through there um Sweet. we're bumped up to a lot of stuff down in that so south are you guys part. not planning like years in advance ever uh in terms of putting in for points no not really not for deer um or elk? we are planning for western stuff or mule deer yeah, yeah that's what we started yeah doing. i mean i have i have five or six points now in arizona for elk yep um a few in colorado how many do you I need in, there? in wyoming arizona What's that? i've been putting in for two years dad and i have two points in arizona for elk yep what do you need, like four or six? Uh, it just depends on what you want. I mean, Arizona has sort of that portion of the tags are random draw. So you could feasibly draw an insanely good elk hunt in Arizona with zero to just a few points. Yeah, It's totally possible. I drew the hunt that I had down there in 16, I drew with one point, and it takes on average of eight to ten. Holy to cow. Draw. That's but I drew it. the one tag in the in the non-resident pool that went to the non-resident. <laughs> did you, did you kill one on that? And then the next year, my buddy Aaron Neal with zero points drew the same tag in the Holy random. Holy cow, man! And Would that be year, Chef, Drew Chef Aaron Neal? Drew, that is Chef uh, Aaron Neal. Wow. Tag. Yeah, Drew drew a tag this year that takes 18, 19 points to draw with four or five points. Wow. Jeez. So you got to put in for it every year, and uh, there's always a chance that you can draw. But it just depends on what you're looking for. You could start to get into some hunts on points with four or five points for elk. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're looking for like the once in a lifetime, insanely great units, you're going to have to wait two decades. Yeah. Unless you draw in the random. Well, probably the toughest part is that my dad and I are trying to go and hunt at the same time. And so I know they have like the yep. point guard system and stuff, but yeah. Yep. Yeah. The, I, we play the Western game all over the place out there. Um, well, but, we, we have to do it even with like Iowa. I know you guys are residents, but like, so we, we got our third Iowa point this year and sure. K Kansas is turning out to be like, what's about a 60% chance you're going to get drawn probably. Yeah. So Depending you're, on the air, you're yeah. like every other year, unless you can figure out how to play it with groups and stuff. And the Dakotas right. are that way. North Dakotas seems like about 50, 50 shot for archery. That's for any deer though, right? Any That's deer. for any deer. deer. Yeah. So we can mule yeah. deer hunt, not just the whitetail tags over the counter. Right. Right. Yep. 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 No, um, I was definitely gone up in demand too in the last five, six years. Like it went from, it went from taking two or three points for a long time to where it's taking three or four now. And it's almost the, for five, the three yeah. Southern units, it's taken four now. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's crazy, but yeah, there's a lot of money wrapped up in those tags by no the doubt. time it's over with as a non-resident. So I got to make it count. Freaking Montana too, man. When you put if you're playing for a Montana elk tag, which I have been doing, it's like twelve hundred bucks. And then they when you oh. don't 
real expensive. When you don't draw, they send you back a check for like eight fifty. Holy cow, it's an expensive yeah, point. You keep a preference point. I yeah, like those places where it's like twenty bucks a point. But <laughs> that's one of those deals where like when I draw a Montana elk tag, it's like I'll drop everything I'm doing and that's what that'll be the thing. Yeah. That's what I do. I elk on about once every three or four years. And when it's when I go, it's that's it. Yeah. I'm not worried about anything else. How about mule deer hunting, Aaron? You ever do any of that? No, not much of that. I would like to, but it kind of goes back to what we were talking about a while ago. Something's got to, yeah, something's got to give. Yeah. <laughs> and what I do, like I, yeah. <laughs> I turkey hunt nonstop all spring, and then I deer hunt most of the fall. So I have a little bit of time every once in a while to take a few weeks off to go elk hunting. I may have a little bit of time to go small game hunting during the winter, but outside of that. Well, that's uh, the cool thing about you know, these Western hunts is typically they start earlier than a lot of the deer season. I know you've got, you know, right. Kentucky and like, the Dakotas are a Western state. You guys, right? you guys should look at North Dakota for mule deer. It's a really yeah. cool Dude, we had place. a black, I'm, like I'm a white tailed deer hunter and that mule deer hunt we went on last year was the most fun I've had last year. I'll probably do it at some point. Heck, I know I'll do it at some point. It yeah. just depends on when right now yeah. i've got um i've got lots of life stuff i have to take care of in the next year yeah you gotta so. you gotta keep happy wife happy life now yep that's right <laughs> so um i'm trying to figure out when mm. i'm gonna elk hunt next and then once i figure that out mm. you know once we get a house bought and do all those things then i might think about mule deer at some point are you gonna but stay i definitely want to go are you gonna oh, stay in columbia fun. area is that the plan? Yeah, we're looking we're looking around there right now. Um, it's a bad market for a buyer. <laughs> bad market, so we're not. I don't know that we're in that big of a rush to buy. Dude, yeah. we, we my and wife I'm and still, I. I'm still living in Iowa at the moment, yeah. and I just come down here occasionally. You know, when I'm <laughs> back and forth. But like I said earlier, I hadn't even been to, I haven't even been home most of the spring because we've been traveling so much. Yeah, that's crazy. and that's usually the case even in the fall. It's like. I'm not home in Iowa and I'm not here a lot of the time because I'm <laughs> living in a tent somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, at some point I may slow it down just a little bit. But some, some adjustments hey. at some point. Yep. Hmm. Well, we'll see. We appreciate your time today, dude. Um, taking some time to talk to us uh, again, like huge congrats, not only on the, the wedding and the new family, but, um, on the business too, man, it, whether you look at it as a company or a brand or not, like it is, and it's, it's a, it's a good one for what the hunting industry needs in terms of, a you know, a group of guys out there that are really waving the flag that represents hunting, I think in the right way. Um, there's a lot of it out there that, that doesn't, and you know, it's good to have you guys out there being what I think is a, a major pioneer and kind of blazing this trail for, a lot of newbies that are looking to get in or a lot of inexperienced hunters that are looking to, to take it to the next level. Um, and just keeping us all entertained, frankly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Dude. Appreciate it. So, but obviously if you guys ever need anything from us, let us know. And, um, you know, best of luck here through the rest of the season, safe travels. And we'll, we'll try to catch you guys again here, maybe before deer season. Sounds good. All right, brother. All right, we'll Aaron. see you, man. Thank you. Thanks dude. See you guys. Good deal. He's a good guy. Mr. And he's still there. And or Britain. Yeah. No, it's cool. Good thing stuff, I didn't man. say he was a bad guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, cool stuff, man. I mean, it, it is crazy to think about how far those guys have come. I mean, you hear Aaron talk about like literally him and Greg scraping together X thousands of dollars to buy a camera and a refurbished laptop to, to start this thing and to, you know, uh, probably building one of the premier content brands in the hunting sector for sure. I mean, there's not many that I think could rival the amount of traction that those guys are getting from, you know, a view standpoint, as well as from a, from an engagement standpoint and, and just good guys too. You know, it, it, it's really one of those things that we probably watch a lot of content in the industry and it's, it's refreshing to watch their stuff to where it's very lighthearted and fun and, kind of like Aaron was saying, takes you back to being that 10 or 11 year old kid of like just having fun and being hunting. Cause I think we all probably take it too serious in some cases, not because it's a bad thing, but 
you know, just because we are so passionate about it. So to take it back and have some fun and, and just see how, you know, you can just go out there and still enjoy that aspect of it. Um, I think it's a really cool thing that they've brought to the table. Yeah, I agree. So, well, hopefully everybody enjoys uh, this episode of Hunter Podcast, number 18, as I was corrected earlier. Um, we appreciate Aaron taking some time, and we'll have to wrangle in the rest of the crew at some point, um, and maybe we'll get them at ATA or something like that. That would be a good spot to, to bring them all in on. That would be very cool. So, But we appreciate it, and uh, we will see you next time on the Hunter Podcast. It's take me oh.